Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming over to this JAEA event. Now we are going to be opening the Japan Atomic Energy Agency supported fiscal year 2020 briefing session of the research and development related to Fukushima section. I am Fukutomi the Business Administration Department, a General Affairs from Fukushima, and I will be serving as your MC today. Thank you very much for having me. At the reception, we have handed you the materials, which includes the program of today and lecture materials and exhibition for posters and panels, maps and questionnaires and JAEA research brochures and 10-year history of Fukushima sector. The questionnaire paper is going to be collected at the reception desk when you are departing this room at the end of this event. Without ado, in representing the host, we are calling upon Mr. President Kodama Toshio of the JAEA to have his opening remarks. I am Kodama, President of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, thank you very much for attending our FY 2020 briefing session of the research and development related to Fukushima sector. I would like to extend a brief greeting on the occasion of this briefing session. I would like to begin by thanking the town of Tomioka, the International Commission on Radiological Protection, Fukushima University, and Fukushima National College of Technology, as well as all the involved for their cooperation in holding this briefing session. I would also like to ask the mayor of Tomioka town to deliver a speech later. It will soon be 10 years since the Great East Japan earthquake. Immediately after the accident, we have carried out on-site radiation measurements and decontamination dem and later expanded our activities to include decommissioning research. We have been working diligently to restore the environment and decommissioning, but we believe that there is still much work to be done for reconstruction and that we cannot stop the progress. We have chosen the subtitle of this conference, 10 Years of Progress, to report on the current status of our efforts to date and the challenges we must face in the future. The decommissioning and environmental recovery effort at Fukushima are attracting international attention. This week, the International Conference on Post-Nuclear Reconstruction, co-sponsored by the Japan Atomic Energy Agency and the International Commission on Radiological Protection, ICRP, was just held. In today's debriefing session, we have asked three people representing international organizations to make an invited lecture on the past and future challenges in Fukushima from their respective perspectives. We have also asked Mr. Ono of Tokyo Electric Power Company Holdings, Inc. to make an invited lecture, including his expectations for the Japan Atomic Energy Agency. As for the research results of JAEA, after the overview report, we will introduce the results of research and development for decommissioning, research and development for environmental recovery, and development of research and development infrastructure, each of which is set out in the activity policy at Fukushima. In addition, there will be time for a poster session led by students from the Fukushima University, Fukushima National College of Technology, and the University of Aizu. We hope you will take a look at the efforts of these young people who will be responsible for the future. Next Saturday, December 12th, 
The fifth decommissioning creation robot contest will be held at the Naraha Remote from technical colleges around the country will compete in a robot contest to come up with a free idea to solve a decommissioning problem. And we have cre summarized the report too. Uh, we in taking this opportunity, I would like you to take a look at our report on the website. In conclusion, I hope that today's briefing will provide an opportunity for you to deepen your understanding of the 10 years that have gone by and the future of our agency in Fukushima. Uh, thank you, and please enjoy the day. Now next, we would like to call upon the mayor of the Tomioka town, Mayor Miyamoto Koichi, to have a word of greeting. Mayor Miyamoto is not able to come over to this venue because of his uh, official work. Therefore, uh, Deputy Mayor Takahashi Yasuaki is going to be reading up his uh, letters and messages. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Takahashi Yasuaki, Deputy Mayor of Tomioka Town. Unfortunately, due to official duties, Mayor Miyamoto will not be able to attend today's briefing session. Therefore, I will read his message on behalf of him. Congratulations on this event for holding the debriefing session of FI 2020 Fukushima Research and Development for Fukushima Sector. I would like to extend my sincere welcome and thank everyone involved for their efforts. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you for your continuous support for the reconstruction of Tomioka Town. We would like to thank you again for your special support and cooperation. Due to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, the entire town was subject for evacuation, and even now some areas are so-called the difficult to return zone. On the other hand, in some areas where evacuation orders have been lifted, and three years and eight months after the order been lifted, uh, 1,045 households and 150 people living in the area. In the town, by improving the living and shopping environment and the industrial park, uh, we are pushing forward with various measures such as job creation, but we are not seeing the repatriation of our people. In that contest, the Fukushima Research and Development Department and all those who are working hard to improve nuclear science and technology and to foster human resources are contributing to the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and the restoration of our hometown's environment through research and technology development. Your tireless efforts day and night will lead to the safe and speedy decommissioning of nuclear power plants, which is the wish of the residents who will live with us. I am very pleased and would like to express my sincere thank you. It will soon be 10 years since the accident, uh, but there are many issues that need to be solved for decommissioning, such as the status of fuel debris and the problem of high radiation levels inside the reactor. In our town, International Decommissioning and Environmental Research Center, ICRIC, as a hub for gathering wisdom from around the world, has been serving as the main hub. 
we are addressing the challenges of decommissioning, but in order to overcome the various challenges and proceed with safe and reliable decommissioning, we need to nurture next generation. And to do that, we have to cooperate with the academia government and the industry. The decommissioning and recovering the environment and the reconstruction of Fukushima is all in one coin. So as the leader of the hub for such a leading role in Hamadori, uh, we have realized the International Center of Education and Research on Hamadori, which will be a center of knowledge hub and a leader in reconstruction of Fukushima. The town is committed to the development of an international education and research center. Therefore, uh, we would like your continued support in the future too. We will cooperate fully to do our own role too. And in conclusion, I wish you all a fruitful debriefing session and combining wisdom for decommissioning and environmental recovery. I sincerely hope that it will further drive the reconstruction and greetings of the local representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takahashi. We are honored to have distinguished guests, including Yoshino Masayoshi, a member of House of Representatives, Ms. Kaneko Emi, a member of House of Representatives, Mr. Endo Satoshi, Mayor of Hirono Town. Mr. Hashimoto Toru, a member of Fukushima Prefectural Assembly. We are really honored to have these dignitaries today. Thank you for your participation. Then let me introduce some greeting telegrams for this event. From Mr. Shimizu Toshio, Mayor of Iwaki City. Then we are going to have today's lecture session. Due to the COVID-19, the presentations will be given in recordings. The first speaker is Dr. Claire Cousins, Chair of International Commission on Radiological Protection. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Claire Cousins, and I'm the chair of ICRP from Cambridge in the UK. I've been the chair of ICRP since 2009, having been a member since 2001. I was the chair of Committee 3 on Protection in Medicine for four years in addition. When I was uh, working and before my retirement, I was an interventional radiologist at Cambridge University Teaching Hospital. I would like to thank JAEA for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about ICRP and Fukushima today. ICRP has certainly been involved with the people of Japan and Japanese colleagues since the Fukushima Daiichi accident. At the time of the accident, the Commission did react fairly promptly and concretely. One of the first things that ICRP did was to send a letter of sympathy to the people of Japan, and we have subsequently sent anniversary messages. I'd just like to share with you a couple of comments that I feel are fitting and still relevant from our one year anniversary message. So in 2012, we said, 
It is fitting to pause to reflect, to remember the great losses suffered by the Japanese and to take stock of the current situation. Recovery will continue for many years to come and ICRP will continue to be actively involved. And I think we can be proud to say we have definitely done that. So what else has ICRP done with regard to Fukushima? Well, soon after the accident, we launched Task Group 84, which was a task group of the main commission chaired by the then vice chair of ICRP, Abel Gonzalez. And this was to compile and learn our first lessons related to our system of radiological protection in connection with the accident. In the autumn of uh, 2011, a few months later, ICRP began its dialogue initiative. And then 18 months after the accident, the ICRP main commission had a meeting in Fukushima city in October, 2012. And at that time, not only did we have a meeting, but ICRP commission main commission members also, we went to, to visit where rice was being screened. We went to people's houses to see the decontamination process in action. And we went to meet farmers who were picking their fruit. In 2013, it became obvious to ICRP that although our publications 109 on the protection of people in emergency exposure situations and publication 111, protection of people living in long-term contaminated areas after nuclear accidents or radiological emergencies. Although these publications had only been uh, released in 2009, it became clear that we needed to update these publications in light of what we had learned from Fukushima so far. So task group 93 was established at that time. I've mentioned task group 84. It was established in uh, 2011 and released its findings in 2012. It recognized 18 issues and 11 recommendations on many different aspects related to the accident. It highlighted that we needed to improve our understanding of our system of radiological protection that can at times seem complex. We needed to resolve confusion about the understanding of, from the public and others, but also confusion of understanding our different terms and language and technical issues. There were also issues regarding how we communicate radiation risk, our quantities and units, and particularly when these are translated, the levels of protection. We also uh, recognized the large impact of the psychosocial consequences of the accident. Protecting rescuers and volunteers was something that the system really needed to address in future, as well as looking at public monitoring, crisis management and information sharing. And many of these issues have gone on to influence the ICRP programme of work subsequently. In 2011, we also established our Fukushima Dialogue. This has been a series of 22 meetings held in different parts of the Fukushima prefecture to discuss openly challenges of the recovery process and to share experiences with local, national and international experts, with local and affected people and many others. This initiative from ICRP was initially with support of foreign organisations but as ICRP has stepped back a little, there's then been joint cooperation between the Fukushima residents and ICRP supported by Japanese organizations as well. The dialogue can really be divided into three different stages. Phase one was for the first four years up to 2015. And this was the dialogue initiative led by ICRP which consisted of 12 different dialogue meetings and an international workshop. The second phase of continuing the dialogue lasted for two years, 
up to 2018. And as I say, ICRP had stepped back and it was leaving the local people to lead the uh, dialogues more, but was still in collaboration with ICRP. And there were seven meetings. Since 2018, the Fukushima Dialogue, as it is now called, has been an NPO led by uh, local people with a president, Ryoko Ando, a lady who has been very actively involved with the dialogue from the start. The success of the dialogues, and we can say they've been successful, has been due to the dedication of various different people, but I'd particularly like to recognize some of those from ICRP. Jacques Lachard, the vice chair of ICRP, has really led the initiative, along with Otsura Niwa, who was a main commission member at the time, and our scientific secretary, Christopher Clement. In addition, the success has been due to our four sci assistant scientific secretaries who've come to work in Ottawa with the scientific secretariat from Japan. And very importantly, and not least, I would like to acknowledge the dedication of the many, many Japanese people who have actually come forward and taken part in our dialogues. Many different topics have been discussed over the last nine years. People wanted to know if it was actually safe for them to return to their, actually, to their homes and about the rehabilitation of their living conditions. Is their food safe to eat or not? What was going to happen to the education of children and young people? They wanted to learn of the value of tradition and culture in Fukushima and how to make sure that was not forgotten. Many people were involved in their own measurements of radiation and how that helped them regain some control. And most importantly, people realized the, they needed to share experiences they gained uh, together. After four years, there was an international workshop in December 2015, bringing together all of the work that had been done in the previous uh, four years. This is freely available on the ICRP website, was, but was also published in the annals of the ICRP. And it was the first time that an, IC, an annals of the ICRP has actually had a, a photograph on its cover and not just the, uh, the typically blue print. In addition, there has also been the ICRP dialogue initiative, which is also available on the web. This recounts the stories of four years of the dialogue concerning the rehabilitation of Fukushima and is extremely interesting to read and learn about. ICRP had, as I mentioned, publications on emergency and post-accident recovery with its publications 109 and 111. Immediately after the accident, ICRP made publication 111, the protection of people living in long-term contaminated areas after a nuclear accident or a radiation emergency. This was made freely available to the uh, people of Japan as it was felt it was important to have our message uh, available for those that were working in the recovery area. But again, as mentioned, we also realized soon after the accident that these publications would need to be updated fairly quickly. And so over the last seven years, task group 93 has been working tirelessly to actually achieve this. The chair of the task group is Michiaki Kai, who was a member of ICRP committee four and is now a main commission member with the vice chair Toshimitsu Homa. There have been many meetings over this time. And the successor to these publications, 109 and 111, will be ICRP publication 146, the radiological protection of people and the environment in the event of a large nuclear accident. This publication should be available in the next few weeks. 
And what is different in this publication? Well, I say it will certainly supersede the previous publications, but it contains detail of the recovery during early, intermediate and long-term phases. It addresses not just the radiation uh, effects, but the environmental, the societal and the economic consequences of the accident, which we know are so important. As highlighted by task group 84, there was a need for protection of responders, and this has been considered and included in this new publication. The co-expertise process has been highlighted where one needs to share experiences and knowledge to promote self-help actions and to implement local projects with the local people to aid their recovery. There are a set of reference levels and there are very detailed annexes on the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. There was certainly considerable engagement in the development of this publication. There was input from stakeholders from around the world, as well as from Japan, but this involved central and local governments, citizens who'd been affected, experts and many organizations, and people from the nuclear power industry. This very extensive engagement was, was managed through not only our Fukushima Dialogue Initiative, but through different workshops and other expert meetings. And we're grateful to all those who made that possible. There was also considerable consultation on the drafts of this publication. There was invited peer review of advanced drafts uh, through international and Japanese stakeholders. The draft was discussed at the, one of the Fukushima Dialogue meetings and there were stakeholder workshops held both in Fukushima and Tokyo. For the first time, ICRP accepted comments in a foreign language, obviously in Japanese. And also for a consultation, we had a record number, 308 sets of comments, all of which have been considered during the very extensive public consultation. We have just had our four day ICRP recovery conference that finished yesterday. Why the conference at this time? Because we know that even after a decade following the Fukushima accident, the story is not over. ICRP has learned very much, but we still have many more lessons to learn as do many others. Appropriately, the dialogues are now being managed and led by local people but ICRP is committed to continue assisting those who are affected. At a time when COVID is, pandemic is engulfing the world, ICRP hopes that this conference will aid recognition of the challenges that still face the residents of Fukushima, lest people start to forget. The conference has had various objectives we want to share experiences from both the Fukushima and the Chernobyl accidents. We want to enhance international understanding of the current state of recovery in Japan. And I hope that the conference has achieved this. It seemed important to consider strategies that may accelerate the recovery that's still needed. And we wanted to improve preparedness for, uh, for recovery from any possible future major nuclear accident. I'm very proud of what this uh, conference has achieved, and I think that we may uh, consider the, uh, the outcomes for a while to come. Going forward, the dialogue and communication with local people has been shown to be and will continue to be key in regarding past experience. ICRP has been fortunate enough to learn this through its series of Fukushima dialogues. ICRP will of course continue to work with Japanese colleagues and people over the coming years. In the next decade, ICRP is looking to review and to refine its fundamental recommendations. And I am confident that lessons that we've learned from Fukushima and other large nuclear accidents 
will certainly form part of this revised recommendations. Very finally, I would like to say thank you to one individual. Hiroki Fujita is the current Assistant Scientific Secretary of ICRP. He's been with us since 2018 on secondment from JAEA. And I'd like to say a big thank you for J to JAEA for, for giving us Hiroki for this time. He has worked tirelessly with ICRP while he's been with us, and in particular with regard to our publications and to regard to the recovery conference. So Hiro, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cousins. Now we would like to have a lecture from Director General. Good morning. I'm Bill Magwood. I'm Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. It's a pleasure to address you today at this JAEA Annual Symposium of Fukushima Research and Development. I wish we were all together in Tomioka. I appreciate the opportunity to visit Tomioka in the past and would like to do so again in the near future. I'm sure that once this global pandemic is over, we will have an opportunity to gather again and to have a good chance to discuss the issues and to consider the path forward on many fronts. In the meantime, I hope all of you and your families are very safe and healthy during this global crisis. I will address you today about a variety of activities related to the post-accident recovery situation and what we have been doing in the international community to support Japan as it goes forward with the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi site. First, let me say that as a person who has been involved in this issue since the very beginning, it is very important to note there's been so much progress made towards stabilizing the facility, reducing risk, and to beginning the stages of recovery for the entire area. A lot of work has been done. A lot needs to be done in the future. But I think it's important we take note of the accomplishments thus far. I will begin by giving you a very quick overview of the NEA itself. As you can see on this slide, the NEA is an association of 33 governments. Our job is to build, build cooperation between those governments, and those governments are the countries with the deepest experience in nuclear safety, nuclear regulation, nuclear technology, nuclear science. And we bring those countries together to solve interesting and difficult problems. We also work closely with countries such as China, Brazil, and India, and we work through a framework of standing committees that bring experts together to address the issues. The NEA is also the home for 24 major joint projects, research projects, many of which are associated with the Fukushima Daiichi incident, and from which countries come together to do research to solve very interesting issues. I'll talk about a few of those as we go forward. We are also the home for several major international cooperative frameworks, such as the Generation 4 International Forum, the Multinational Design Evaluation Program, and the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation. Japan is a very important member of all three of those initiatives, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with our Japanese colleagues. I want to talk about the main findings from the work of the NEA related to the Fukushima Daiichi accident. In the area of nuclear safety, We've issued the SARF report. SARF was an activity, one of our joint undertakings, that looked at the issue related to the severe accident. And we identified that there were several important knowledge gaps that needed to be addressed related to debris removal, as well as enhancing severe accident management in the post-Fukushima era. We've learned a lot already from the accident. There's a lot more to learn in the future. But it's important, I believe, for the international community to stay very involved in this work as we go forward, including in the debris examination. There's tremendous knowledge to be gained from that. 
we have been looking at new joint projects to understand how to go forward the retrieval and also to know what to look for once we look inside the vessels to understand the, the in-vessel melt progression and also understand how radionuclides were released. We've also done a stash report on recommendations and maintenance and monitoring of safety functions, site cleanup, decontamination, waste management, fuel retrieval, and other important issues. These are activities that we have engaged with Japan over the last several years, and there's so much work that's been identified to be completed. We're looking forward to going forward with this. We are also looking at areas such as how to apply the lessons of Fukushima to the broad nuclear safety community. For example, we have enhanced the approaches for screening external hazards. We've looked at how to improve site PSAs. We're looking at the behavior of nuclear power plant components and structures during extreme events. We're also looking at issues such as fuel cycle facilities and spent fuel pools and how they behave during loss of coolant accidents. All these knowledges have been shared around the international community. And so we have taken the tragedy of Fukushima and we are looking at how we can learn from it and make nuclear energy safer in the future. This is something that the entire international community benefits from, the world benefits from, but at the same time, we also recognize that it's very important that we not slow down the important decommissioning work of Fukushima site as we go forward with this analysis. We believe that both can happen at the same time, that there's a, there's a, 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 a synergism of having the international community learn from this experience, but also having the international community contribute to the solutions to get the site cleaned up as quickly as possible. A good example is the work we've been doing in the area of radioactive waste management. We've done important work in bringing experts to Japan to talk about how to approach dealing with radioactive waste at the site. A clearance and release program is going to be very important. And as you know, issues such as discharge of contaminated water is a major issue in Japan, and international expertise and advice can be helpful as you make decisions. Also, how do we treat the large, the large amounts of low-level waste that will come from the cleanup program? This is going to be a very important challenge. As many of you know, there's low-level waste distributed throughout the prefecture as a result of the accident that will ultimately need to be disposed of. But before it's disposed of, it has to be characterized in a very efficient and reliable fashion. There's also gonna be a very important challenge on how we deal with the high level waste at the site. Well, there's no DGR currently available, so it has to be stored for a long period of time and managed carefully. And finally, there's going to have to be an overall centralized management and cooperation scheme that will enable this work to be done in a very coordinated fashion. This is very important, and the reports that we have done have given a lot of advice in this direction. But there's a lot more that needs to be done. Another area where we've been very active is in the area of radiological protection. This, I think, is going to be the most far-reaching aspects of the site around the world. Thinking about the important lessons learned from the accident itself, the evacuation that took place, and the recovery operations to date. Think about, for example, the practical approaches to consider mental health aspects of evacuation of the populations when there's an emergency such as Fukushima Daiichi. Before the accident, there really wasn't a lot of conversation in the international radiological protection community about mental health aspects. Now there is because of the lessons we've seen and because of the reality on the ground. It's also going to be very important to have a very, a very comprehensive multidimensional framework for preparedness to deal with the post-accident recovery but as decisions are made along the way. Issues such as how we handle materials at the site and what responses are done in the course of the accident, the accident response, will have far-reaching ramifications for recovery as we go forward. That has to be taken into consideration. Another very important issue is food safety. We believe at the NEA that an international food safety framework is essential. It's essential to provide the trust necessary for people both inside a country like Japan that has experienced a radiological event, but also those outside to show that this food is safe. And despite the fact that there's been so much important work in Japan regarding assuring food safety, there are still those who have doubts. The best way to do that is to have an international framework to verify 
that what has been done in Japan to assure food safety has been appropriate, has been correct, and that the people should be, should be convinced that the food is safe. This is very important in any radiological incident, not just nuclear power plant incident, but large releases of any type. And this is something we think should proceed as quickly as possible. We've also learned a lot about stakeholder involvement in decision making. This is going to be a very important aspect of the Fukushima Daiichi cleanup, as well as many other aspects around the world. Stakeholder engagement has become, in our view, one of the most important drivers to success in any nuclear activity. But in particular, anything related to cleanup is going to be important to engage in the, uh, in, to engage the public stakeholders. As we go forward, there's going to be more work to be done. Research in particular in various fields related to things such as severe accidents will be important aspects of our work going forward. We are very interested in understanding the mitigation of melt progression in ex special material transport of gas combustion, radioactive releases, many other different phenomena that we have to do analysis. And we believe that the Fukushima Daiichi site provides a unique opportunity to understand these phenomena, to characterize them, and to share that knowledge around the world. Not just to help make sure that there are no future incidents, but also to enhance the cleanup work at Fukushima Daiichi itself. We also expect that one very important issue that many people are very interested in, in is how cooling water injection measures during a severe accident actually work. This was a live test. There's a lot to be learned from what happened when these cooling waters were injected. And we need to reassess the effects of, you know, of containment, pressurization, and resulting in release past hydrogen and radionuclides for long-term water management. So this is something that we can learn a lot as well. Also, issues such as preparedness of regulatory organizations is something that we have to consider. I think we've already learned a great deal about this, but human factors as well. And as I think many of you know, the NEA has made a tremendous investment in understanding how human factors play into nuclear events. And we have been very on the forefront of looking at issues such as safety culture. And we're looking forward to working with our friends in Japan to take this work even forward, further forward. Also, radioactive waste. Again, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important to have a centralized management of, of the radioactive waste, to have a, an approach to characterize these wastes, to make sure that we have a sampling program, cooperation on all areas related to government, the industry, research institutions, and all stakeholders. It's going to be very important if this is going to be successful. The regulatory framework has to be based on the specifics of the incident. We have to have a flexible approach to make sure that we're making good decisions and not wasting resources on things that don't, they're really not important to safety. We also have to look for ways to make sure that the waste are minimized. This is a very important consideration because if we do this the wrong way, we will magnify the problem by creating more waste when we don't have to. So this is something we should be giving consideration to. And of course, again, stakeholder involvement, very important. We, we've seen around the world many times that when stakeholders are not fully engaged, when stakeholders don't buy into the processes and decisions that are being made, then this leads to questions in the future and sometimes reversals of programs. It's very important to bring them involved in the very, from the very beginning. We also have important work to do in radiological protection, in particular in looking at post-accident recovery. This is an area that the NDA has become very interested in, and many of our members are looking at very closely. As a result, the next international test exercise called INEX-6 will be done in a couple of years, in a few years, to exercise the planning and preparedness for the transition to recovery phases after an emergency. This is the first time we've ever practiced this. So we're going to use this exercise, INEX-6, to identify gaps in policy, preparedness, and perhaps also regulations that need to be updated. We've never done this before, so it'll be a tremendous opportunity to learn from this. We're also going to start to look very closely at these mental health aspects. I mentioned this before. Understanding that decisions made by authorities, particularly when it comes to evacuation, have huge impacts on people. I personally have visited Fukushima Prefecture many times, both soon after the accident and in the years since, 
And I see that even to this day, there are mental health issues that people are still dealing with. Fear and, 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 and sadness still are in the minds of people. And this has to be taken into account. This is a, this is a, these mental health aspects are as important as radiological impacts on health. And governments have an absolute responsibility to understand this and to take them into consideration. Finally, an issue that I'm very interested in is the issue of optimization. Optimization is a very esoteric concept to many people, but it's one that is growing within the radiological protection community. Optimization really in a, in a very simple way just means making the right decisions under the, under the situation that you have in front of you. That means not just applying rigid standards and rigid regulations, but to look at the overall situation and to make decisions that optimize the well-being of the public as the first priority. That doesn't mean that everything has to be cleaned up to the lowest iota. It doesn't mean that every, every gram of radiological material has to be cleaned up, but it might mean that some things stay in place because that might be a better decision than displacing people and creating a lot more difficulty for people at, to avoid tiny, tiny amounts of, of contamination that really have no human health impact. These are issues that have to be discussed, but they also mean engaging very closely with stakeholders to see what stakeholders want to do. And what we have found in situations around the world is very often stakeholders are willing to allow some contamination to stay in place in order to achieve other goals. And these things have to be taken into consideration. So the approaches and tools to find these balances is going to be a tremendous effort to develop. We're fully engaged in this, and we're looking very much at different aspects of this. And we believe that working with our friends in Fukushima Prefecture, there'll be some opportunities to test some of these concepts. We recognize that the most important thing is to know that this is not going to be a situation where we can come up with one answer that will be applicable to everyone. It will be one of those situations where we have to have a methodology to understand the situation and then to apply it to the very specific circumstances in each case. And so there's no one size fits all approach to this. We have to work with the culture, the people, the traditions on the ground, and then find out what the best solution is for them. Post-accident recovery can be enhanced by making this recovery process a bridge to a new normal that is designed in large respect by engaging with the stakeholders. This is something that's very important. So I'll conclude by just saying that there are basically a few major challenges that sum all this up. Most important, sharing the experience that we are getting from the Fukushima Daiichi cleanup. This is a, a unique opportunity to learn so much that will help in nuclear safety, radiological protection, waste management. These lessons can be applied around the world We've already learned a lot, there's more to be learned, and I fully expect that we can work with JAEA and other institutions in Japan to make sure that we can learn those lessons, make support the cleanup work to go forward efficiently, but also make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to take valuable information and apply it around the world. We also have to develop a multi-dimensional, multi-framework approach to make sure that we make optimal decision making. This optimization effort that I've mentioned earlier is something that is not just related to Fukushima Daiichi, it is really a, a global approach to look at regulations and decision making in a different way. The NEA is planning a stakeholder engagement workshop that will be held in late 2021 or early 2022 that will focus on this issue of optimization. So we will look forward to having people, perhaps in Fukushima Prefecture, join us in this conversation to give their views on optimization. And that this is something I think will be very, very important going forward. Finally, whatever happens, whatever lessons we learn, it's going to need to be very important to, and to root these lessons learned into policy and regulation. And that might make some changes in regulation. And that might also mean regulatory processes have to change as well. So these are things that we have to deal with. They're very complicated issues, but I think working together, we can find good solutions. But again, our biggest priority is to make sure that the people of Fukushima Prefecture are able to get on with their lives, to put the accident behind them, to put 311 behind them, and to have a prosperous future. 
that it's a part of our responsibility as an international community that's benefit from nuclear energy that has applied the same regulations and technologies that were at Fukushima Daiichi. And, and so we all have some responsibility to assist them in their recovery, to assist Japan in the cleanup of the site, and at the same time, benefit from the knowledge that will be gained. So that is the purpose of this, this gathering today. So I hope that all of you enjoy this very important discussion and that we all benefit together as we go forward. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and thank JAEA for the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to my next visit to Japan, my next visit to Fukushima Prefecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Magwood. Next, from Unsquare, this is going to be the... The next presentation is from Dr. Gillian Hirth, Chair of UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. The title is Development since the 2013 Unsquare Report on the Levels and the Effects of the Radiation Exposure Due to the Fukushima Accident. Good day to you all and thank you to the JAEA for inviting UNSCIA, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, to be part of this annual symposium on Fukushima Research and Development Program. As the current chair of UNSCIA, it is a privilege and an honour for me to provide an overview of the committee's work and the development since the 2013 UNSCIA report on the levels and effects of radiation exposure due to the Fukushima accident. UNSCIA is the scientific committee of the United Nations and the highest authority on the, in the UN on radiation levels and effects. Its mandate is to assess sources of exposure to radiation and their effects on health and the environment as a sound basis for decisions on radiation related issues. Its findings have, for example, underpins the 1963 Partial Test Ban Treaty and the current international safety standards for radiation protection. However, it does not deal with policy matters itself, but has an important role in disseminating its findings to the UN General Assembly, the scientific community and the public. UNSCARE is composed of scientific experts nominated on the basis of scientific qualifications, experience and expertise by 27 countries that are states members of the committee. I am representative of Australia to the committee and its current chair for the 66th and 67th sessions. It is now approaching 10 years since the triple tragedy, the earthquake, the tsunami and the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. And I am sure that you are aware that the committee conducted a two-year assessment of the levels and effects of radiation exposure from the accident and reported its findings to the UN General Assembly in 2013. More than 80 scientists from 18 countries worked on this report, which together with scientific annexes was published in April 2014 in both English and Japanese. And the findings were shared at events in Koryama and Fukushima City the same year. So let me recall the main conclusions of the UNSCIA 2013 Fukushima report, which took account of information available up to October 2012. Overall, the committee expected cancer rates to remain stable. That is to say that no discernible increases in cancer rates due to the radiation exposure were expected. There was a theoretical and small increased risk of thyroid cancer among children, most exposed in 2011, but this was not expected to be discernible. No impact on birth and hereditary effects was expected. The doses were too low. No discernible increase in cancer rates among workers was expected. And there was a transient and geographically localised impact on wildlife. Following the pu publication of the 2013 report, UNSCIA established a standing mechanism to systematically track and review new scientific information as it became available. 
This follow-up process saw the establishment of an expert group of specialists who tracked, screened and systematically reviewed new scientific literature across five key thematic areas listed here. The expert group examined the new material in scientific papers, journals and research reports to identify whether this new information materially affected conclusions of the 2013 report or if it addressed research needs identified in the 2013 report. More than 300 publications were reviewed covering the period from December 2012 through to December 2016. The results of this follow-up work were published in the 2015, 16 and 2017 white papers. For each thematic area, each white paper first recalls what the 2013 report had concluded, and then the new information is reviewed against that. This helped the committee understand the relevance and importance of new material, and again highlighted areas for future research. The results of its follow-up work found no major challenges to the 2013 report. The white papers were again shared in Japan at events in Iwaki, Manami Soma and Aizawakamatsu City. All of Unsky's reports on Fukushima to date are translated into Japanese and are available for download from Unsky's website. So let me recall a little about the sequence of the releases in the early days following the accident. The animation you see on the screen is a graphic display of how dispersion between 11 and 31 March 2011 was predicted using modelling. As you know, there was some reliance on models in the early days following the accident in order to estimate doses. The two most significant radionuclides released to the atmosphere from the perspective of exposure were radioiodine and cesium. On the basis of the reviews of information from the white papers was that the new published estimates of releases were broadly consistent with the 2013 report estimates and in fact were somewhat lower. Also, it was reconfirmed that radionuclides other than those considered are not major contributors. Overall, through the review of the white papers, was that the updates do not significantly influence the public dose estimates overall. Thus, we can say the overall picture remains unchanged. But new information was identified that could refine the estimates, particularly for some groups or components of the dose estimates, and reduce and improve the understanding of the uncertainties. I will also note one important issue that has been of concern, and that is whether there is an increase in thyroid cancer. There have been reports of an increased incident of thyroid cancer among young people in Fukushima Prefecture. But the evidence presently is that this is not due to radiation exposure, but rather to the screening effect. The screening phenomenon, whereby rates appear to rise with intensive screening campaigns, is well known and documented worldwide. We can see this perhaps best from the screening study in three unexposed Japanese prefectures, where they mimicked the screening protocol used in Fukushima Prefecture and also found very elevated rates of thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer, very similar to those found in the Fukushima study. The reasons for the screening effect is that small thyroid cancers in the general population are already present but are not normally detected. Intensive and highly sensitive screening detects these small cancers and rates appear to rise. In Fukushima, the reported excess cases occurred too soon after exposure to be due to radiation. Moreover, the distribution of thyroid cancers with age at exposure does not match the experience from the Chernobyl accident. In Chernobyl, by 2006, a total of 6,000 thyroid cancers had been detected. The peak incident rates was observed 10 to 12 years after the accident. And perhaps half of these cancers were of a spontaneous nature, while the other half were due to the higher thyroid doses from drinking milk containing radioiodine. At its 65th session in 2018, 
the committee con considered a project plan to produce a new report on Fukushima. The aim was to produce a report setting out a summary of all information to the end of 2019 on the levels and effects of radiation exposure due to the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and the implications of the new information for the UNSCU 2013 Fukushima report. The committee reviewed progress at its 66th session in June 2019 and further reviewed the scope of the project to also provide an updated detailed analysis of doses to the public. At that time, the committee expected that the technical document would be submitted to the committee at its 67th session in July 2020 with a view to its approval at that time. This project is now coming to closure and comprised over 30 experts from 12 countries and one international organisation. The expert group has reviewed over 1,000 peer-reviewed articles in preparation of its report that was considered by the committee at its 67th session. So as I noted earlier, the 67th session had originally been scheduled for July 2020, but as a result of the COVID pandemic was posted was postponed from July till November. A session that was for the first time in the committee's 64 year history held online from the 2nd to the 6th of November, 2020. The committee did review the draft report in July, 2020 and reported on progress in a note to the General Assembly. Specifically, the committee noted that a lot more information had been made available on the occurrence of radionuclides in the environment in particular on concentrations of released radionuclides in the air as a function of time and their physicochemical forms. So I am pleased to advise that the committee considered the 2020 Fukushima report for approval in early November. And we now anticipate this approval to be confirmed by the end of November. During our review of the report, the committee did note that the update to the 2013 report had enabled earlier estimates of public radiation doses to be improved and uncertainties to be reduced and better understood. This was because the update takes account of Japanese specific conditions and important information, including measurements in people and the environment that were not available for the 2013 report. Consideration of remediation actions on dose reduction in the evacuated zones were also discussed as was the effect of high precision screening on the frequency of paediatric thyroid cancer. Finally, the committee also discussed the appropriate use of collective dose estimates in the context of the Fukushima accident. In summary, we can conclude that the findings of the 2013 UNSCE report have been broadly supported by new scientific research that has emerged since and this has been captured to date in the CAP Committee's white papers up to 2017. There were some interesting scientific developments that needed further follow-up, but on the whole, the larger picture remains unchanged. That being that the estimated doses received by the Japanese public remain low. While there have been some minor changes taking into account new information, uncertainties and variability, it remains unlikely that we will see any discernible increase in cancer rates in the future. All of our publications so far, the UNSCI 2013 report and supporting fact sheet, UNSCI white papers, and the booklet for public on radiation are all available for free download in both English and Japanese. As outlined in my presentation today, the committee have also undertaken work commenced in 2018 to update the UNSCI 2013 report. And while I would have liked to have been able to report more to you, the outcomes of the UNSCI 2020 report, the pandemic has impacted this report finalisation. I am also pleased to advise that the UNSCI 2020 report on the Fukushima accident is expected to be published in English and Japanese and launched by UNSCEAR in the first quarter of 2021, before the 10th anniversary of the accident. UNSCEAR outreach in Japan to discuss in detail the UNSCEAR 2020 findings is tentatively scheduled for 10 to 18 May 2021, subject to, on, subject to the ongoing pandemic situation. 
Finally, I would like to thank you for inviting me to share this information with you today. And I encourage you all to explore the information available on UNSCI's website on the impacts of the Fukushima accident. And I look forward to 2021 and the publish, publication of the UNSCI 2020 report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hirth. With this, the FY 2020 briefing session of the R&D related to the Fukushima sector, the morning session will be concluded. From here on to 1.20, we are going to be enjoying lunch break and we are going to be having the exhibition for the posters and the research uh, results. And there's a public opening for the clouds too. This is an announcement for your lunch. So the area to enjoy your lunch would be the second largest room and then the first, second and third training room. And for those people who have reserved their lunch bento box, we would like you to make your payment at the second floor of big main room and to receive your lunch box. Box. And for the venue to uh, enjoy your lunch, for those of you who have not reserved the lunch box, uh, you also could be able to uh, be associated in the room. And on the first floor lobby and the small halls and level second lobby, there are some exhibitions from the JAEA and the related organizations. Uh, people are exhibiting their researches. And on Another thing to mention, uh, just right across uh, the venue, there is also going to be the uh, opening of the clads to the public. And uh, we would like you to use the room for the uh, lunch in a staggered manner if this is a congested area. And we would like to start our briefing session from 1.20 again. So please come back at 1.20. Thank you. The afternoon sessions will start. The first recorded presentation is from Mr. Ono Akira, President, Fukushima Decontamination and Decommissioning Engineering Company and Managing Director of TEPCA Holden Inc. The title is The Ten Year History of decontamination and decommissioning at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and expectations on JAEA. I'm Ono, president of Fukushima Decontamination and Decommissioning Engineering Company. It has almost been 10 years since the Fukushima Daiichi accident. The current situation of the Fukushima Daiichi will be presented. Thank you for this opportunity. The, my presentation is on the v recorded format. I regret that I am unable to sit with you in the same room. So the current situation and the challenges of Fukushima Daiichi and our expectations of JAEA will be presented. First, the current situation of decontamination and decommissioning and the roadmap. The Japanese government in December 2011 laid out a meet at long term roadmap. The first phase is for the preparation of taking out spent fuels. In the second phase, preparation for taking out molten fuel debris. And in the third phase, it will take a long time before completion. December last year, we revised the roadmap and the first 10 years of phase one was reclassified as 3-1, during which period the intensive decommissioning will be 
conducted in order to take out molten debris. Other works such as water treatment or removal of spent fuel need to be well planned and conducted simultaneously. In each area, the important milestones are on the screen. So based on these, March this year, these milestones and risk map provided by NRA, so these goals should be achieved and we laid out the important processes to achieve those goals. Then, now you are looking at the processes of our mid and long term decommissioning action plan 2020. So this title has uh, year number 2020 and March next year we will revise this into the plan 2021. We will revise the plan annually. So the important processes, this example is removal of the fuel debris. We will start the testing in 2021 and we will scale up the work. The details are given. Then removal of spent fuel and other work processes are available on our website. The mid and long term decommissioning action plan 2020. Based on this, uh, we will plan ahead. And at the same time, for local communities, then these people will be able to know more about the specifics of the decommissioning. Uh, and also, this provides the material for consideration for joining uh, this process. The national plan has been revised and there has been an important change, which is the achieving, achieving of the re reconstruction and decontamination. The both should be achieved. So the decommissioning should lead to reconstruction of the area. We are committed to the safe work. Then we are going into the main part. But before that, I'd like to show a short video clip which contrasts the situation immediately after the accident and today. March 11, 2011. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station suffered a severe accident. Thanks to the cooperation from many people, we are now working on the decommissioning of the plant. The current situation of the power station, I'd like to look back the, immediate, the aftermath of the accident. Unit number one, two and three, they lost power, therefore we were unable to cool the core, which generated a lot of hydrogen, unit one, three, and unit number four, which was connected to unit three, had hydrogen explosions. Today, all the units are cooled and stable. Unit number one at the time of the accident. At unit number one, the removal of spent fuel from the cooling pool is being planned. We are removing debris for that purpose and we plan to put a large size cover on it and work will be conducted inside. For removal of molten fuel debris, now we are conducting our survey inside the pressure vessel. At unit number two, it was damaged from the hydrogen explosion of the unit number one. Its side panel opened. Hydrogen went out from this opening, therefore the unit two didn't have an explosion. Today, we have closed the panel and we plan to take out spent nuclear fuel from the cooling pool. We are committed to safe work, safe operation. We plan to start taking out uh, fuel debris from the unit number two. In our past surveys, I found that we are now able to manipulate the deposits inside. At the unit three, we are now taking out spent fuels from the cooling pool. 
we planned to take out debris and we conducted underwater survey. We found construction materials and other deposits inside. At Unit 4, we have completed to remove the spent fuels from the cooling pool. We have no risk of carrying nuclear fuel. Seaside area. At the time of the accident, we had debris all around. We removed the high-level waste and we reduced the dose. The removed debris are now stored inside the nuclear power station. The north side of the station is dedicated for the site for incineration plant as well as storage. Countermeasures against the tsunami and earthquake. The tower vent for Unit 1 and 2, although this is seismic resistant, but in order to reduce the risk, about to top half of the tower is now dismantled uh, with the help from local contractors. And in case if another tsunami comes, we are building uh, sea walls. The surface inside the station is covered with mortars to reduce those as well as prevent dust. The work is almost complete. At the time of the accident, all the area needed the protective gears and the face masks. Today, 96% of the area you can work with surgical mask and normal uniform. In some areas, you do not even need surgical mask or a uniform. The large sized break room area. The food stuff from Fukushima is used for hot meals and we now have a convenience store. The well-equipped medical facility is available to support the commissioning work. And next to the administrative building, there is a building for contractors. Now the collaboration is easier. Our countermeasures against contaminated water is improving too. The contaminated water is generated from rainwaters coming in from the damaged buildings as well as underground water. When water touches uh, radioactive material, it is contaminated. We place facing on the ground and we also pump up underground water from wells and surrounding the buildings. We put underground ice walls to prevent underground water from coming in. The damaged buildings are now uh, being repaired. The underground water going into the sea is stopped by the steel plates at the seaside and we pump up underground water at wells which uh, keeps the water inside the bay area safe and clean. Around the power station, at many areas, we are conducting a sampling. The concentration of has come down significantly. Now it is below the national level. The radioactive particle in the waste, the water is treated by multinucleus removal system. So the particle other than tritium are removed and the water is stored in high reliable welded tanks. We are committed to safe and steady decommissioning, which will need 30 to 40 years. We will harness the expertise both from Japan and outside the world.
Let me go back to the slide deck. First, countermeasures against contaminated water. On this point, as you can see on the slide, there are three highlights. Number one, prevent rainwater or underground water from coming in. Then ice wall is part of this initiative. So thanks to this, the volume of contaminated water at in May 2014, the volume was 540 cubic meters, and it was reduced to 180 cubic meters in 2019. This year's goal is 150 cubic meters as an average. Number two, the water stretch after treatment. Number three, removal of the water inside the turbine buildings and reactor buildings to reduce risks. Today, my presentation will focus on number two and number three. Then, water treated by multi-nuclear removal system. As I mentioned earlier, the daily generation of contaminated water has come down significantly. However, we are still having contaminated water from rainwater and underground water. This is a fact. Then we need to treat contaminated water with multi-nuclear removal system and we store the treated water in tanks. The capacity uh, was 1.23 million cubic meters at the end of October. Our plan is that we will expand the capacity to 1.37 million cubic meters by 2020. Then if current uh, trend continues, then summertime 2020, all the tanks will be full. The handling of contaminated water has been discussed at the National uh, Committee. There have been 17 meetings since 2016, and this year the proposed proposal was issued. Then evaporation or release into the sea uh, were considered, and the release into the sea seems more viable option. Based on this proposal, the national government is now having uh, discussions with experts and stakeholders. So when the national government makes its decisions, then we will follow that and we will start discussion with the national government and other stakeholders as well as experts and start necessary works. Specifically, then what kind of measures can be taken? This slide shows an example. March this year, then for the benefit of the general public and the stakeholders, that we provided this material. As you can see, number one, the treated water. Then if the, to if the total concentration is below one, then uh, this, if the water is more contaminated, then we will treat them for the second time. And we will add carbon-14 as well as other seven uh, major particles. Number two, then the independent survey organization will take samples from high concentration tanks to verify that the total concentration level is below one. Also, the tritium concentration will be managed to make them less than the national threshold. Number four, the when releasing water, then we will be able to stop the operation immediately if something happens. Number five, we will enhance the ocean monitoring and the result from which will be shared immediately. Then the multi-nuclear removal system will be evaluated in September and October. Then. We took out samples from the high concentration tanks, 1,000 liters at a time for testing. So this graph shows the uh, effect of the secondary treatment. Now you can see that seven important nuclei, as well as strontium-89, the concentration of which has been removed, reduced significantly after the second treatment. 62 Nuclides, carbon-14, and tritium, total 64 nuclides will be measured, and the result will be provided in December. 
then in the first treatment and the second treatment, we believe that the total concentration will be less than one or national threshold. So next is about the removal of stagnant water. Highly contaminated water remains in the reactor turbine building and waste treatment building. In the event of a tsunami, it could leak. With that in mind, removal is underway. In March 2017, we succeeded in removing the contaminated water from the turbine a building of the Unit 1 rec reactor. Since then, the work has progressed smoothly, and in the middle of this year, the treatment of the tree turbine building, the waste treatment building, and all the buildings of Unit 1, 2, Unit 3, and Unit 4 were completed. And we are now going to be uh, reducing this retained water. The main building and the high temperature incineration buildings of processes main building were also targeted to complete the treatment of the retained water by 2020. However, a recent survey of the buildings revealed a high radiation source, so the policy has been changed. The building serves as a buffer or water tank for the post-accident highly contaminated water before it is treated with cesium absorbers such as curion and sulei. Zeolite sandbags for absorbing radioactive materials are located in the basement floor. And investigations have been showing that the zeolite have a high dose rate. If we remove the stagnant water from the building, there will be no shielding by the stagnant water and the radiation dose in the building may be high, so we are in the process of considering some measures to deal with this. And I will tell you about the progress of fuel removal from the spent pool, pool of each unit. As for the current situation, work on Unit 4 began immediately. After the accident and all work was completed in March 2014, next in line is Unit 3, which began extraction in April 2019 and is currently ongoing. The other units that have had accidents, Unit 1 and Unit 2, are in the preparation stage before they are taken out. Uh, retrieval is scheduled to start in the middle of the 2020s. For Unit 1 and Unit 2, we decided the last year to take them out. And for Unit 1, we have the pool fuel changer on the south side above the building, and then the overhead crane, and then the roof materials are piled up. If these are not removed, the pool fuel cannot be removed. In order to do this work safely, we have covered the reactor building with a large cover. And underneath the cover, we will remove the debris and take out the spent fuel. For Unit 2, the plan was to dismantle the existing upper portion of the reactor before installing the cover and remove the fuel. But the plan was changed to remove the fuel without dismantling the upper portion. As the people living in surrounding area are returning and reconstructing, we decided to use both methods to prevent the dust containing radioactive materials from being dispersed. The following slides will show you the recent situation in units one to three. Unit one, it has experienced a hydrogen explosion and the top floor of the reactor building has collapsed to the operation floor. The structure, especially on the south side where the spent fuel is located and is complex with debris and debris piled up from fuel handling equipment, overhead cranes, collapsed roof materials and slabs covering the spent fuel pool. So to remove the debris, we have a number of measures in place to prevent as much as possible of the steel frames and slabs from fall falling into the spent fuel pool, as you can see on the slide. Most recently, we have completed the installation of the support structure that will support the fuel handling equipment from the bottom. For Unit 2, the situation in the spent pool was checked by underwater ROV in June 2020. We have confirmed that there are no new issues that interfere with the extraction of fuel. Lastly, Unit 3. Unit 3 was taken out by the Tokyo Metro uh, since last April. And now the work is progressing smoothly. We plan to remove all 566 fuel assemblies by March of next year. And lastly, the related topic, 
I would like to touch on the dismantling of the Unit 1 and 2, the exhaust stack. There are four stacks on the site and the Unit 1 stack was damaged because of a hydrogen explosion in Unit 1 and we already confirmed that the tower would not collapse in the event of a major earthquake, but we decided to dismantle it to half its height to reduce the risk. The work began last August and was completed in May of this year. The demolition was carried out remotely but this technology was developed and dismantled by a local company on Hamadori or the coastal area of Fukushima. Next, I will talk about the efforts to retrieve fuel debris. In order to retrieve uh, the fuel debris, we first have to understand the situation inside the containment vessel. To do this, each unit was investigated by measuring the inside of the containment vessel using cosmic ray muon and remote control technology using robots. We also refer to the analysis results, and based on the investigation so far, we estimate the state of the fuel debris as follows. In Unit 1, uh, estimation is that almost all of the molten fuel has fallen to the bottom of the containment under the pressure vessel. And Unit 2 estimates that on molten fuel, fuel debris has fallen below the containment uh, vessel, while quite a large portion remains in the pressure vessel. And Unit 3 is something in between Unit 1 and 2. A lot of fuel is down below the containment of the reactor, but we estimate that some is at the bottom of the pressure vessel. We decided last December to use Unit 2 for debris removal. The reason for this is that we have a better understanding of the situation of debris in the containment than in the other units. And the reason for this is that the radiation levels are lower than in the other units due to environmental improvements. And there is a prospect of debris removal in parallel with the removal of fuel from the pool. The debris removal for Unit 2 is going to start with a robotic arm shown at the bottom of the slide. We're going to be taking a trial basis. The arm is up to 22 meters long, long enough to reach the containment vessel. Uh, we're going to be utilizing the metal brush or vacuum container for retrieval. And we have pl planned to gradually scale up the retrieval using a similar mechanism. In the near future, uh, there are plans to use a boat type device to investigate the interior of the first unit container vessel. And we are currently developing a boat type device with diving capabilities to understand the distribution of sediments found outside the pedestal during the 2017 survey. In order to insert the device, we drilled a hole in the X2 penetrometer and installed a guide to insert the device through the hole. The, the plan is to put the device in the containment vessel through this guide. And we are currently in the process of building the access route from X to penetrometer. penetrometer. The work will begin in 2019 and we will complete the cutting of the outer door in April of this year and the inner door in May of this year. After that, we are in the process of cutting the grating and other interfering objects inside the containment. Uh, this is an overview of the research we do after creating the gas pedal route. The start date of the survey has been delayed beyond our initial expectations, so we cannot say when it will start at this time. Uh, we decided to use five different types of survey equipment, including cameras, So they include cameras, 3D shape, and thickness measurements of the sediment and sampling, depending on the purpose of the survey utilizing uh, the line. Since these devices will be wired to control them, a guide ring will be attached to the wall to prevent uh, long cables from snagging on the boat-shaped device as it moves along the bottom of the containment. In the medium to long term, uh, we would like to expand the scale of the removal based on the debris to be removed from Unit 2. In order to remove the debris from Unit 1 to 3, we will remove the exhaust stack of Unit 1 and 3, which will be in a obstacle outside the building, and install the necessary equipment to remove the debris. Uh, removing containment, contaminated pipes 
and decontamination is under consideration. So we will also be working steadily on setting up further debris retrieval and storage facilities. And now let us talk about waste management. Our storage management plan predicts the amount of waste that will be generated over the next 10 years. And then we come up with a plan to install the necessary volume reduction and storage facilities. The plan announced in July 2020 estimates that a large amount of uh, waste is going to generate. So according to this estimate, the debris is forecasted to be generated around 780,000 cubic meters over the next 10 years. These weights will be classified according to do uh, dosage and form, and cut trees and used protective clothing will be incinerated, and metal will be cut and torn down to 260,000 cubic meters for eventual storage in the respective storage facilities. Among the volume reduction facilities, the initiation plant for miscellaneous waste has already started to operate. In March 2016, incinerating used protective clothing, the construction of a solid waste incinerator for lumber trees is also underway and is expected to be completed by the end of this year. And the installation of concrete and metal volume reduction equipment is currently underway and to be completed in fiscal year 2022. And with these measures, we aim to store the waste that is currently stored outside into the facility by 2028. And secondary waste uh, from water treatment generated by contaminated water treatment will also need to be managed like solid waste. We will try to move these indoor management as well. The construction of the large waste storage facility of the adsorption tower is underway from June 22, uh, 2020, with the aim of starting Operation 2021. And now I would like to share with you our measures to stop COVID-19 from spreading. So at Fukushima Daiichi, uh, we make sure that people take temperature readings before coming to work and to wear masks at site. And we are uh, taking staggered use of rest areas too. And we ask people to refrain from going out of the area or having meetings outside our boundary. For newcomers of the plant, they are to uh, go through uh, the PCR testing or stay for two weeks at home. And thanks to these measures, there have been no cases of COVID-19 infection among our workers and the subcontractors. We will keep on continue to take thorough measures to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 among the workers of subcontractors and employees. And hit by COVID-19, uh, the masks and the uh, protective gear is uh, lacking in Japan, however, for us we are able to uh, secure the correct and right amount of these gears. And finally, as a person in charge of decommissioning at Fukushima Daiichi, I have some requests for JAEA in terms of analysis. And so first of all, about the analysis of alpha nuclides, as shown on the left-hand side slide, in a nuclear building where we are going to treat contaminated water, there is sludge in the bottom of the contaminated uh, water and the bottom of the torus room. And we have to pay attention to this sludge during the treatment process. So recently we analyzed the stagnant water and found relatively high concentration of alpha nuclides. And with the help of JAEA's analytical capabilities, we would like to go on through a thorough analysis. The various knowledges and analytical capabilities of JAEA, not only in terms of alpha nuclides, uh, your capabilities and knowledge will be very useful for us. So first, I would like to ask for you, your cooperation in recruiting and retaining analysts at our company. And for this purpose, I would like to ask JAEA's engineers to provide direct practical guidance to our engineers. And at the same time, we would like you to be involved in the training of our young and mid-level engineers. 
And secondly, I would like you to support the design and operation of the analytical facilities that we are planning to develop. We're going to be starting to design and operate analytical facilities to handle high dose unsealed radiation. So we would like you to share your expertise and knowledge that you have accumulated over many years. And last but not least, JAEA is now located in the coastal area that includes Tomioka Town, where this conference is held. And in addition, there is a concentration of various research facilities and companies involved in decommissioning projects. We will do what we can do to help the region's recovery through increased technology and employment in these organizations. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ono. Then we are going to have the briefing session of the result from sector of Fukushima Research and Development Works. We are going to have the Q&A session after the presentations. If you have questions, raise your hand during the Q&A session time. Then a microphone will be on the way. Please be noted that questions should be limited to the presentations. First, we are going to have the presentation from Ms. Dr. Miyamoto Yasuyuki. Good afternoon. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Miyamoto from Planning and Coordination Office. So today I'm going to talk about the overview of the works at sector of Fukushima Research and Development, the history of this sector. So as you can see on the slide, so March 2011 we had an ac we had the accident, and since then we established the Fukushima Support and Headquarters. And in the same year, in June 2011, we opened the Fukushima office and we started a fledged operation. Then somewhat later, in 2013, the ARID was established. At that time, JAEA joined the operation of IRID and we started our research and development for decontamination and decommissioning. In April 2014, we op now the sector of Fukushima Research and Development was established as a dedicated organization. In 2015, we opened the Iwaki office And we also started the work with Fukushima Prefectural Center for Environmental Creation. In 2016, we opened the Naropa Center for Remote Control Technology Development, or NAREC. And later, in, at Tomioka, then we started the operation at the CLAD, or Collaborative Laboratories for Advanced Decommissioning Science and also just close to Okuma or 1F site, we completed the administrative building of Okuma Analysis and Research Center. Then this slide is about our facilities inside the Fukushima Prefecture. We have several offices in Fukushima and Iwaki and laboratories Firstly, about environmental research and development. So we have uh, the lab in Miharu Town and Minamisoma City. Then the R&D about decommissioning. Then very close to the power station, we have Okuma Analysis and Research Center, so low-level nuclear waste is to be analyzed at this facility. Now the facility is under construction. June next year, we will start the operation. As I mentioned earlier, in Tomioka town, 
we have the building of CLAD and also in NARA we have a NAREC facility. This is about developing remote control technology. Uh, and about this research and development, they are based on the Fukushima Innovation Framework. And uh, we also work with a Fukushima Robot Test Field Organization. Then, then our work, three main pillars as our initiatives. Number one, reclaiming the environment. Number two, R&D for decommissioning. And lastly, the putting foundation for R&D. Then we established and launched necessary institutions and facilities. Then collaboration is also important. So sector of Fukushima R&D, so, but we are not alone. Then we work with JIEA, Atsuruga, and Ibaraki area facilities. So JIEA has a rich experience and data, and JIEA has many researchers. So we will work closely with these uh, specialists to develop the necessary technologies. Then, of course, there has been an effective human network and sharing of information and experience. And as well, one more important thing is that the task force for decommissioning has been formed on this point, then a related the managers and directors, uh, they also work with us. So the cross-corporation or cross-organizational structure has been established. Sorry, the slide seems not to work. Just a moment. Here it is. Let me continue. Then activity at the CLAD. Then let me give you some highlights. So Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station 1F, the decommissioning of 1F is one important task. So current topics include the analysis of the accident scenario. We simulated the 1F accident, and we also conducted a damage test, and also we visualize the dose level in the buildings of 1F. So the achievement from this then will be used to design the removal of molten fuel debris, as I see it. So in this perspective, then we'll be able to contribute to the promotion of decommissioning. And also R&D for reclaiming the environment. Since the accident, JAEA used an uh, automated monitoring system, and also uh, JAEA launched the human monitoring field work. And uh, this is something we have, have been doing. And then we will uh, report at municipalities if necessary. And our report has been used to make a decision about uh, lifting the ban to return to difficult to re return zones. Next is the, our activities at Naraha Center about the facility. So the test for removal of fuel debris it is a mock-up test, and we are now preparing for it. The IRID plans to conduct this mock-up test. 
then before starting the real work at 1F, then we will simulate the testing and we use a mock-up. And um, human resource development is also our agenda. So we provide the programs to give trainings for robot operation. Then both the use of the simulator and classroom lectures will be used. So uh, this has been used by the high schools in Fukushima prefecture as well as college students or businesses. Then Okuma Analysis and Research Center as facilities. Uh, the number one building, uh, which is a research laboratory. The, this building number one will uh, analyze the low or mid-level waste from 1F debris or the secondary waste from water treatment. We plan to open this facility in June 2021. The building is almost complete, the half year to go. And the analysis of debris uh, will be conducted at the building number two. Then a design was completed and we will start the building, the number two building. And the analysis of radioactive nuclides, then we need human resources too. So on this point, then the administrative management building is complete and we plan to open workshops to give training for the analysis work which will be conducted in the building number one. And the employees at Okuma, then they will be dispatched to the test labs in Tokai area. We will second them to the existing facility to get trainings. So our plan is to develop human resources for the analysis in the new laboratory. Then development of human resources for 1F decommissioning. At Okuma, then our plan is to send our people to Tokai to get skills. And at Fukushima Research Conference, or FRC, the, this is about, this is an international conference about decommissioning, uh, basic study. And we have had conferences since 2015. We have one or two conferences a year. Then we invite experts, uh, both from inside and outside the country. We harness the expertise and experience. And the human resource training for 1F decommissioning. Mainly, the businesses join this program to develop human resources. Then we give the information and training as to the current status and our project of the decommissioning of the 1F. So we, we have the help from NDF. The engineers or researchers, they know very much about their specialties, but the adjacent area is something difficult for them to know. Then through this training, then the coordination will be more effective in order to get a bigger picture. Then our major achievements from our R&D, then I summarize the press releases in the past. So the top, I do not go into details today. So uh, let me skip uh, this slide. So, so please refer to your material. That we worked closely with uh, local companies or sometimes uh, we usually actually use the tools or equipment we developed in at the one F site. Summary. In order to solve challenges for decommissioning, we will continue our R&D. Then we will also provide 
technological bridge between R&D and actual implementation. This way, we think we can uh, contribute to the safe and steady 1F de decommissioning about environmental reclamation, then the, those survey and also make assumption of the reclamation and decommissioning will be a very long time activity. Therefore, the human resource development, both inside and outside the country, will be important. We will develop the uh, human networks. And it's been almost 10 years since the 1F accident. So in this anniversary, then looking back the past 10 years, then JAEA's past activities and the contribution to the reconstruction of Fukushima. Now our activities over the 10 years is compiled into a brochure and it's available on our website. That's it from me. Thank you for your attention. Now next, we are calling from uh, the CLADS Environmental Dynamics Group, Environmental Impact Research CLADS, Mr. Nisato Tadafumi, and uh, the Integrated uh, Analysis Group, Ms. Sasaki Miyuki, and she is going to be talking about offsite activity and achievement uh, R&D for environmental recovery from the class with Mr. Nisato. Thank you very much for having us today. And coming from CLADS, uh, this is Nisato from the uh, Environmental Dynamics Research Group, Environment Impact Research Division. And I would like to report to you what we have been doing for the offsite activity and achievement and R&D immediately after accident. So today uh, I'm going to be talking about the dynamics and the last part of the development of monitoring uh, devices is going to be reported from Ms. Sasaki. Uh, this is the uh, research and how we have been moving on from the past. Right immediately after the accident, we have been supported by uh, the uh, country. And in the next year, we have been starting the project uh, for CCM. And then we started about the uh, long-term development in 2015 and 16 from Fukushima. Uh, part of the uh, creation group of Fukushima in Minami Soma, uh, there was a monitoring device development in Miharu Machi. We have been working on the uh, research for a development on environmental dynamics. And now it reaches until today. At JAEA, right after the disaster happened, uh, based on the disaster con countermeasure basic act, we have been designated as an organization to work. And by that, we have been taking on various activity and more than 45,000 people. Uh, so this is more than 10 times staff that is working for us right now. And all these number of people have been working for us. And we, we have been testing to uh, reduce the radio, uh, radiation level at Fukushima School. And we have been supportive of creating models to reduce the radiations and decontaminating the pools. And all our works has been utilized as a logical uh, information for the government as such. And after that, we have been uh, supporting the technology for decommissioning and not only lecturer, but along with people, we have been uh, trying to disseminate the uh, technology. And so before uh, the country, the central government and the local government starting to the uh, decontamination activity. For us at JAEA, we have been organizing the guidelines for decontamination. And in order to do that, we have been working for the investigations. And uh, the we, Ministry of Environment has been summarizing such guidelines. Therefore, we consider that we have been making great contribution here. And uh, utilizing our technology and uh, knowledge you, uh, that we have acquired, 
uh, we have been developing a system called RESET, which supports the decontamination activity. This is the distribution data map for the uh, radiation and uh, the uh, utilizing the uh, factors for reducing uh, the uh, surface uh, contamination and utilizing the decontamination factor, uh, we have been making evaluation and support, we were supported of the uh, local government's uh, decontamination activity and we provided the concrete data. Now let us talk about the uh, environmental dynamics. Uh, regarding the environmental dynamics, uh, there were two big, large concerns, and we wanted to answer to these concerns. That is why we have been uh, researching. One research is that the cesium could be moving by environmental changes from where it is not cleaned up to the area where it is cleaned up. And for those cesium could be coming into the arable land and arable land could be seen and hide those. That was the concern of the people. And in order to answer to such concerns, we have been trying to investigate it utilizing the real arable land and mountains. We need to have a very a complicated but detailed knowledge. And so such knowledge will be contributing to create a model and to understand the distribution of the cesium in the future. And by providing such information, we were able to come up with a forecast. And so that is about the research here. Regarding this dynamics, there are mainly three uh, initiatives that we have taken. One is uh, during the environment, we are going to be uh, considering of understanding the transition behavior of the cesium-3. And then one, another one is model development and send out information. And the third is also to be sharing information, which is organizing the uh, site emitting information. Uh, first of all, I would like to comment on how cesium is moving around in the mountains. So during our observation, we have been creating a plot like this. So we have been uh, making a fence within the soil. And the fence is created of steel. And within this steel box, we were observing and taking, collecting all the soils back to our research center in order to analyze. And having that as a sample, calculate how much cesium is moving around in the mountains. So within the uh, forest, not changed artificially from 2013 to 2018, the cesium has been moving around 0.18 to 0.07% in the Konara Oak. Uh, but then in area where there was wild fire and remainders of these uh, fire areas, uh, right after the incident, the cesium movement was high, but then after two years, uh, it is becoming half of 0.16% uh, because there are um, layers of fallen leaves. Uh, therefore, even if uh, people are considerate about the move around of the cesium, it happened to turn out that cesium is not moving around so much. We were able to provide this information then. It is used for the local government's explanatory uh, materials. And when we are looking into the movement within the river, as shown, at periodical level, we are concentrate, uh, collecting the water from the river beds and try to separate them with soil. Uh, the cesium, it, which could be melted within the river, is called uh, the uh, melted water. And the other one, which is in soil, is called suspended state. And we have been showing the differences by ages. As shown, both of the state is showing decrease. And uh, the time lapse utilizing such data, uh, we were considering how much time or year that cesium is going to be decreased. And uh, utilizing this simulation, uh, we will be able to have an clearer view how much the environment is going to be recovering. And so as a, a scientific information, we were to contribute to uh, the information. 
And regarding the fishes within the mountainous river, we wanted to observe what was happening with such fishes. So we were looking into the concentration with the Yamame fish. Uh, regarding the staple isotope and we know that this fish is distributed in various part of the river in the mountains and as you can see uh, compared to any creatures on the land or plant within uh, or under water we found out that the uh, stable isotope is differently distributed in land and water so looking at the result uh, for the higher cesium those are uh, the fishes eating uh, some insects that came out from the uh, fallen leaves or mountainous area where cesium was high. But on the other hand, uh, the Yamame fish eating a bait that comes straight from the uh, wild mountains untapped by the cesium. It shows low concentration of cesium. So it depends on what they eat. And this is also uh, information that is provided to the local government. And we are creating a model of the relationship with the uh, fishes and the mountainous area. This is a compartment model. So there are several separate items, which is a box. And we are going to be uh, observing uh, in different boxes how the cesium is going to be changing and how the quantity of the cesium is changing. And this is a model that we can calculate to come up with a timing. And one of the results is shown on this chart, which is in dotted black. So the observation point is shown in black dots, and then it shows on the horizontal side about the ages, the lapse age. And, the, and as a calculation, in all the roots, the, by saying all the roots, this is a, a one, two, and three roots that I show on the middle. and. By following the route, it decides on the concentration of the cesium. And this is going to be an information uh, to become a rational logic in order to restart fishing in the mountainous area. And this could also be applied to the um, mushroom harvesting within the mountains too. So that is how we're going to be wanting to utilize. And lastly, utilizing technology that I have just mentioned. Uh, last year, there was a Typhoon 19, uh, and we have been applying our uh, model to the torrential rain. So when I have been explaining about the river water, we found out that the cesium level is gradually decreasing. And so the area and the sediment that has lower cesium is going to be packing up. Then uh, the uh, sediment is going to be showing higher uh, concentration. However, the surface of this land originating is going to be showing lower cesium concentration. Therefore, starting 2014, we are finding that the cesium around the river bed uh, showing in yellow and green is showing lower cesium. And then we found out that the typhoon also remediates the level of concentration of cesium as well. As you can see, uh, you could see that the radiation has been decreased going through the uh, process that you are seeing. And when we uh, found out where the cesium came from uh, during the typhoon, it came out from this uh, map that you see from the uh, mountainous area. Usually this is a, a dried up water river and usually uh, this cesium that is concentrated in this area will not come down to the river beds usually. And so uh, we have understood as a result uh, that when typhoons, the cesiums within these uh, dry water could be moody, moving around, but usually it does not. And we have been referring to this information to the local government. Now I am changing hands to my colleague. This is 
Environmental Dynamic Research Group. My name is Sasaki. Uh, the chart that you are show, uh, seeing is about the achievement of monitoring technology that we have developed at JEA right after the accident. We have been looking and monitoring the wider area because there were such needs. Thereby, we have been developing such techniques or technology that we can monitor. And so we have been utilizing NA survey meter, which is a survey by dots or else a pedestrian uh, survey, or else maybe we have had some survey on uh, the drones and such. By utilizing various combination of monitoring, we have been working on measuring as a, a governmental po uh, project. And currently, uh, JAEA is working for such project. And for the monitoring from the air, we used aircraft monitoring. This is a manned helicopter monitoring to do the measurement regularly. Uh, first of all, we have been uh, measuring with the cooperation of USA, and JEA has been succeeding the technology as a governmental project. We are still uh, ongoing with the monitoring. And for the unmanned uh, monitoring around the area of 1F, uh, because of law that on the area of the manned helicopter is not allowed to uh, fly over there. Therefore, we have developed an unmanned uh, flying substances. Uh, thereby, utilizing that uh, mechanism, we are monitoring around the uh, one if air. The other one is about the measuring uh, for the reservoir used for agricultural usage. So first of all, the technology has been developed by JAEA, and now it's transferred as a technology. And currently, this is a project run by Fukushima Prefecture. And we have been working on the monitoring in the water, too, utilizing the unmanned uh, ship for observation. We have been developing a technology to measure. This is a, currently a national project, uh, and currently measuring the undersea uh, measurement. I would like to go on with the details from the next slide. As shown on the map, this is the uh, manned helicopter measurement and a measurement which was installed on the automobile rooftop. This data, uh, it could be trying to understand uh, the no, no good to go back zone or else in order to decide on the scope of the decontamination. And by each area, we understand that the uh, contamination is decreasing uh, more faster than we have been expecting. Next is about the monitoring by unmanned craft. So utilizing an unmanned helicopter around the surroundings of 1F, which is a five kilometers radius, we did the we are doing the monitoring around the area uh, these days. Uh, we are now measuring the uh, reconstructional area. Uh, there are several areas where uh, the, the no return zone has been lifted, and. We were one of the uh, providers of the data for making the decision making for lifting of the area. And we are, we have been measuring the area where the uh, no fly zone was existing. And by our measurement, we were able to uh, promote the uh, Ministry of Transportation to decide that the no-fly zone could be lifted. Now, uh, this is plastic scintillation fiber monitoring uh, technology, which was relocated as a technology uh, to an Fukushima reservoir company. And these are applied to 3,700 reservoir to measure the accumulation of radiation cesium. The technology is now transferred to Midori Net Fukushima uh, by contract. And currently, the Fukushima, this is 
continued monitoring by Fukushima project. Uh, utilizing this technology, uh, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture has been uh, utilizing our data. Now about the ocean measurement. Uh, this is based on the subsidy uh, to develop a um, practical way to uh, promote and reconstruct the area. We have been developing the unmanned ship in order to uh, work under this subsidy. We have made a press conference on this, and the technology developed is now utilized as a national project uh, measuring the undersea radiation level. The monitoring within the environment was what I have been explaining so far. And all these measurement technology that we have been utilizing in order to contribute to the 1F on-site work site, the plastic scintillation fiber has been applied to the site. Uh, this is a detector placed in 1F site and uh, to detect the leakage of the contaminated water at the work site. We did the testing and currently now it is on operation, actually utilized at the 1F uh, station. On the second floor, we have the actual mechanism. So if you have not seen it yet, please visit and observe this uh, equipment. Uh, by this, we have been working on researches and measurement development, and we are coordinating with various organizations, with the governmental level and the university level and others. And with the help of various organizations, we are keeping up with our researches. We would like to continue on with our research development too. All the data that was acquired by, uh, by us we are to share not only with the experts, but it is very important that we share such information to the local residents. Therefore, we created a site called Fukushima Integrated Environmental Information Site, which is abbreviated and have a nickname of FACES. There's an exclamatory booth at the second court, and we have a QR code to understand this FACES. If you go through this QR code, uh, all the information that we emit is easily um, accessible. Please utilize it. Lastly, this is my summary. So all the data and the achievement that we have acquired, uh, this is utilized for the uh, decision making to lift uh, the evacuation center and is considered to become a scientific logical uh, information so that other organizations can make decisions. And from here on too, we would like to cater our uh, research achievement for people to make decisions too, and to develop the decommissioning work too, and decontamination work too. And so through our research and development, we would like to uh, contribute to Fukushima's reconstruction. With that, I thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you. The next presentation is from Dr. Nagae Yuji from Sim Simulation Test Technology Development Group, Accident Progression Evaluation Division of CLADS. How the fuel debris was formed. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Nagae from Accident Progression Evaluation Division of CLADS. Today, my presentation is about how fuel debris was formed. This is the title of my presentation. Then, my agenda of today's my report Number one, the inside inspection of the Unit 2 at 1F. This test or inspection is ongoing, so therefore I'd like to highlight the spe specifics of the 
deposit inside. Number two, then analysis of mechanism of debris forming. So CLAD's facility at Tomioka, we have a large-scale equipment for investigation of severe accidents in nuclear reactors, or LASAN. This can simulate uh, a damage test of control rods. Then we also use uh, uh, this test to evaluate the melting and transition of a blade of control rod as well as the melting of the fuel and its transition to the bottom of the reactor. Number three, our evaluation of the analysis result as to the removal of fuel debris. We are going to have the actual data from our inspection and testing. We also plan to conduct the analysis of the mechanism of debris formation. And then lastly, then we will give you the overview of our, own, our plans going ahead. Then at 1F, the inside inspection of the Unit 2. February 2019, we were able to contact the inside deposits. Then we identified three kinds of deposits. The gravel-like lumps, as you can see on the left of the screen. Also, some were like plates. So on the left, the, on the right picture, so it's a very flat uh, deposit. And the one more thing is that maybe part of the construction material, half molten objects were found. So this is the result of our inside inspection of the unit number two. Then, meet to a long-term roadmap for decommissioning. Then this states that we are going to start the test removal of fuel debris from the unit number two in 2021. However, the details of inside is not yet known clearly. Then, in order to know more about the inside, then our theme is the analysis of the formation of fuel debris, then melting and transition of the control roll blade. This will be uh, presented today. Number two, then the dynamics of the molten fuel uh, should be analyzed. So not in Tomioka, but in Ibaraki and outside Japan. So the analysis is ongoing. Number three, the analysis of the dynamics of the breakage of the lower head. So this will be included in today's presentation. Number four, then, then how the debris was solidified and also uh, its segregation uh, dynamics will be analyzed. Then. PWR, uh, which is a type of reactor used in 1F, then characteristic of PWR. So in terms of the melt of the materials, then the reactor core consists of many materials. On the left-hand side of the uh, reactor core, there's a fuel assembly and the moderator of neutron, we use the boron carbide. Then the bottom of the pressure vessel, so this is the schematics of the bottom of the vessel on the right hand side. This is a simplified diagram. So at this fuel assembly, we use zirconium and uh, they are uh, put in a channel box. So channel box harnesses these uh, fuel unit. So this channel box is also made of zirconium. And the control rod blade, 
the control rod blade is made of stainless steel. So stainless steel supports the moderator, which is boron carbide. Then on the right hand side, at the bottom of the pressure vessel, then the pressure vessel itself is made from a, a carbon steel. And then and this is the opening for control rod. BWR operates control rod from the bottom. So the housing is made of stainless steel and the stub tube to support this uh, is made of nickel alloy and also we use nickel alloy for welding materials. So these materials are used at a pressure vessel and our theme is to analyze their dynamics at the time of accident and what will be formed. So the development of LASAN or large scale equipment for investigation of severe accidents in nuclear reactors. So we developed uh, this tool for analysis. So this is a unique equipment. So this is the first of its kind all around the world. Then at the time of the accident, then uh, we can simulate the situation in a large scale equipment. So that's the purpose of development of Lyson. Then at the time of the accident, then there was a steep rise of temperature. So it's a very rapid uh, change in temperature. Then about 0.3 to 1 degree Celsius a second. So this speed is variable at Lyson. Then at the time of the real accident, the water evaporates. And we lost water. So at the bottom of Lyson, then temperature is lower, then temperature is higher at the top. So the actual uh, temperature gradient is achievable. And one special thing about this is that you can take a video during the experiment. We have cameras inside at the top and the bottom. And also you can have a top view of Lyson. So we have three cameras on Lyson to uh, take recordings. Then the maximum temperature 1,800 degrees Celsius. Then test of the melting and transition of control rod blades. So let me share our findings. The center of the slide, this is a test material. So the fuel assembly cross-section at BWR, this includes the control rods. So this uh, green shaded area uh, is simulated as the test material. Uh, the length is 1.2 meters. Then the simulation of the accident, how to do it. Then uh, this graph shows the uh, transition of the decay heat. Then the core exposed about three days after the accident. So the temperature went down. So the temperature gradient was very slow, which was simulated in our test. And the quantity of water vapor. The, the, there was little water inside. We also simulated the situation. Then I'm going to show the short video clip of the experiment using Lyson. So as you can see on this slide, these, the tubes top and the camera was mounted on the top to have the top view. 
and also we place the camera on the top left and on the right hand side then you will be able to see tubes so those were the construction of the e experiment so now the temperature has already been up the, you can see the control rod that the control rod starts melting as you can see this is a top view the material is melting and those uh, melted material goes to the bottom of the the equipment you can see this real time and this molten test material then the molten material comes from the top to the bottom then the molten material will transferred from the top to the bottom then question was that at what temperature then we got the data the stainless steel and uh, boron carbide they melt at around 1200 degrees celsius and they start moving toward the bottom so we observed uh, this transition then the formation of metallic debris so this is a result uh, from our test the same we inspected the inside of the unit 2 then likewise at this experiment we f found the pebble like deposit or plate like deposit and also half molten metallic deposit we observed these three kinds all of them are from this test then the main component stainless steel was the largest component and boron carbide so these materials were found from this simulation These slide, these photographs show the results uh, from the inspection of the unit number two, and on the right hand side you can see the simulation simulated results from a laser test. So you can make comparison between the real thing and the simulation, as I mentioned earlier. Then a plate-like deposit, and the half molten metals, and at the bottom. then gravel like small lumps so we got these three kinds of deposits as we found in the inspection of the unit number two we were able to simulate and recreated the situation now from here then the test about the melting and transition at the bottom of the pressure vessel control rods melted and they dropped to the bottom of the pressure vessel then at the bottom then there's an opening for control rod operations then there was a high temperature reaction and the deposit inside the pressure vessel actually went out of the pressure vessel so uh, the process was simulated in our test so we also used a laser so sorry for the complicated picture here then here's a, the bot simulation of the bottom of the pressure vessel then the molten metallic material are from the channel box or a zirconium from the fuel assembly as well as the stainless steel from control rod blade and the moderator which here is the boron carbide then we mix these materials and then we turned the heat up then we observed the transition as the temperature went up our findings uh, we have a video clip for this so uh, let me show you the snapshots from our experiment 
the top left. So just the beginning of the heating, the metallic part, zirconium or stainless steel or boron carbide, they are still intact. They were solid at the beginning of the test. Then we applied more heat and metallic material, zirconium, stainless, or boron carbide, they started to melt at around 900 degrees Celsius. So this bar shows the melting points of different materials, zirconium or steel, they melt at around 920 degrees Celsius. So we expected these metals start to melt at around 900 degrees. Then further on, with higher heat, then a molded simulated material, the metallic housing or the welded constructions with nickel alloys, then these started to have reactions at around 1100 degrees Celsius, then simulated materials molten materials breaks the housing and the molten material went into the pipe and eventually they fell off from the simulated pressure vessel. So we observed this happen. It is still early days to get the detailed analysis of the results. Evaluation of the anal analysis data of the a transition of fuel debris, that how the debris was formed. So this uh, experiment should give an answer to this question. Then at our laboratory, then as a mechanism, so from so this diagram shows the transition of resolidifying from the high temperature to lower temperature. We are also studying this process. The molten debris includes many kinds of components, uranium, zirconium, and others. So it includes many elements, and also we need to and know exactly what was the condition of the accident, the quantity of water vapor, steam, or temperature, or the temperature gradient. These will affect the formation of debris. Then the simplified diagram looks like this. Uranium, zirconium, and oxygen, and after melted at high temperature, then as it cools down, then how to change its phases, that which is the focus of our study. Then 2021 and beyond, we are going to have the result from the analysis and also our theories will be tested against the result of the test. Then I think we'll be able to simulate the exact situation inside the reactor vessel at the time of the accident. Then our plans moving forward, as I mentioned earlier. Then internal inspection of the unit number two was conducted. Then the debris forming was the result of a very complicated uh, process, and the debris is has a complicated uh, form. Then. We will develop the analysis skills and we will apply those technologies and skills for analysis in order to know the situation of the inside of the pressure vessel. We will enhance the accuracy and eventually uh, we'll be able to contribute to the scale up of the engineering for the removal of molten debris uh, from actual units. Lastly, then the studies and the experiments like this, 
uh, this is conducted not only in Japan, we work with uh, specialists from the world. The severe accident analysis has been conducted at the Sandia National Laboratories in the US and large scale uh, experiment has been conducted in Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. So we jointly conducted tests with them and in Scandinavia, the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden or a Technical Research Center of Finland, they have equipment too. So by working with them, then we will analyze further how the material melted and uh, re-solidified. That's how we have conducted and how we plan to conduct our study and experiments. Summary. So at our institute, then the world's first large-scale test equipment, or LISAN, this is a unique set of equipment, and by using this, our plan is to analyze the mechanisms of mechanism of the debris formation. Then the analysis and the study will of course need the collaboration between countries. So we invite specialists from other countries and uh, let them work on a lesson. And then our plan is to evaluate the results of the test in 2021 and beyond. I think we'll be able to grasp the bigger picture of the formation and situation of molten fuel debris. And uh, we'll be able to use that knowledge and the results. Thank you. Now next, from CLADS, uh, for the 3D Imaging Technology Development Group and Remote and Technology Division from CLADS, Mr. Kawabata Kuniaki is going to be talking about R&D to understand spatial information needed for decommissioning. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from CLADS. I am coming from the 3D Imaging Technology Development Group Remote Tech Division. My name is Kababata. And today I'm going to be sharing my achievements on the research development done to understand the uh, spatial information needed for decommissioning. So today I'm going to be sharing uh, technology development utilizing within the uh, containment container. So. Uh, this is a target for everybody, uh, the 1F decommissioning for Tokyo Electric Company Holdings is now occurring since 10 years ago, and by the impact of the accident. It is difficult to presume what is happening inside uh, the uh, containment vessel, and uh, we already had an information beforehand, uh, before the accident, but then now after the accident, we don't know what is happening. We call this in English unknown unknowns. And so it is very difficult to assume what is going to be impacting the uh, containment vessels. And the potential risks is hard to understand by us, uh, which is making our work very complicated by having said that. But we would like to promote the decommissioning in a safe manner, in a security manner, uh, and especially within the uh, building. Uh, there are several things that we are uh, mindful of. This is to reduce the dose exposure of the workers, which is very important. And I think you all follow us by media. And this is about the remote control of robots. Utilizing such robotic technology, we try to uh, de decrease the risks for a uh, dosage and exposure for the workers as much as possible. 
Regarding the unknown unknowns, uh, first of all, uh, before having the workers, the human being, go into the area, we want to decrease the unknowns as much as possible to uh, make it into a known knowns. And so we do the survey, first of all, before the work and then create a plan. And uh, with the mock-up, we simulate the uh, rehearsal for uh, the work that is to be done at real term live. And by doing that, uh, we are going to be uh, simulating the routine works to understand that the radiation level is acceptable level. And so that is ongoing currently. So uh, considering such process, first of all, a pre-investigation happens. Uh, therefore, the uh, data information collection where people are going to be working, we need to have uh, the information collected. This is uh, the most important thing of all. And within our 3D imaging group, in order to utilize uh, this to the decommissioning for the working area, we are now collecting information and making calculations and to lead it into a technology. That is our um, aim. So today I have two big topics. One is about, first of all, we know the healthy state of the uh, containment vessel, but then we no longer can expect that healthy level. Therefore, we need to understand the uh, condition of the three-dimensional structure of the workplace. We have to understand the structure of the area where people are going to be working, and we have to be uh, making schedules how people are going to be working in the area, bringing what equipment. Uh, therefore, our information data is going to be utilized in those areas in order to have people work in safety model. And the other thing very necessary is the distribution of radiation, which is very difficult to understand. And this is also going to be uh, channeled to the uh, making schedules of how people are going to be working at on-site. And it is going to be contributing to the um, a peace of mind for the workers. And at our group, we are working on two points, uh, the understanding of the three-dimensional uh, information within the uh, working area, and also think about the distribution situation of radiation in the workspace. And because of that, we are working to create such technology. And in large category, uh, these are what we do. We do other things as well, but these are the two main topics. And regarding two topics that we're working, let me introduce what we're doing. Uh, this is creating a technology in order to make retrieval of the area that people are going to be working. So as mentioned, it is difficult to assess what the uh, condition is. Maybe it could be a healthy state, but then there could be some debris falling off or else maybe uh, cued by a strong force. And so understanding the space for work is very important prior to the work. And by understanding such information, uh, the inhibitor of work is understood. For instance, maybe workers would like to go into the very farther end to the room. However, there could be some inhibitors or obstacles not letting people go near to the uh, end. So. Understanding such thing is important. And after the mock-up, we're going to be having a simulation environment so that people can make training there. So if we are to be understanding much more detailed information, then we can have better simulation environment. And for the remote robots, thinking about the investigation that we do, it happens with human being workers too, but then Everybody use, is utilizing the camera, uh, uh, an action camera, uh, to record the workings. However, what cameras can bring is the two-dimensional uh, illustrations or photographs. Therefore, it is difficult to understand uh, for the three-dimensional way. Maybe you can understand by your memory, but then it is difficult to understand the situation in two dimension. And, uh, we don't want to understand and make a judgment by having various numbers of 2D uh, images. We want an immediate 3D in information so that people can in intuitively understand what they can do.
And so that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to retrieve uh, 3D uh, information from 2D. For instance, when people are working, it's a dark area and you have obstacles at your foot. And for human beings, maybe they might want light, but then the condition of their work is very limited in many of the sites. Therefore, if we can have a 3D images at hand immediately, then it will be useful for the workers and in ideal. Once camera takes an image, then that image will be uh, connected to the people at once, which could be uh, catering to the uh, work. So that is the ideal status, and we are working for that state. Uh, first of all, uh, for uh, the making the 3D information from 2Ds, I would like to talk about the principles. So I'm not going into uh, details, but then I would like you to understand what's happening. First of all, these are movies and there could be several photographs. And uh, by the extracted photographs, images, uh, there are some features within the images and we try to retrie retrieve such characters uh, from the 2D uh, visions. We are trying to find out various characteristics in order to create a 3D image. Uh, that's by, by calculation. So we uh, match the characteristic and we make this into a matching uh, vision. And then we have a various matching plot and various images. When we look together, we now uh, look into the key points and we call this SMM procedures. And you do not see the structure at once just looking at the points. Therefore, it's a multi-video process linking the dots of the characteristics and then coming to the images it try to expand to increase the dots to have vis better visions and then after that uh, we're going to be having the uh, mesh process to create the framework of the model and then coming back to the uh, vision we're going to be sticking on that texture to the 3d image and by that, we're going to be having an environmental model. And then when the model is turned around, you can see the 3D vision. That's the uh, basic ideal uh, principle. But you have to have a very good light in order to have that. And even if you have the all out uh, view of the 360 degree, uh, the vision is only uh, going to be showing at uh, this resolution therefore we need a better environment but then there is none therefore we are trying to work with a bad environment to create a good uh, vision and for uh, retrieving the 3d uh, images uh, first of all we had to understand that this is viable within the 2d photographs and the mini bamboo uh, it's a name of the robot and utilizing the robot we went into the uh, crd housing and we have been looking through the bottom to the top through the camera and we have been applying that process that i have just explained and we created such model this is the original uh, image and the feeling that you look for the first vision and the second vision, you see that the second vision is now distorted, um, morphed, so it's not going well. And the image itself is now connected, but then in the terms of three dimension, it's not enough. Therefore, we need to improve that dimension wise. And we tried to do that several times, but then it found out that it is difficult to make it into a good way. Regarding the uh, vision, with our research members, we had making an analysis. And when the lighting condition was not well, the more the more a camera goes into the darker point, uh, the vision is not going to be better. And the robot having the lighting, maybe the uh, forefront area will be white in image because there's light nearby. In order to make this adjustment, we try to make a contrast adjustment in order to make the vision clearer. So I only have one picture to show to you, but then maybe you can just see that you can see a better contrast onto the right hand side. And uh, this vision, having going through a process of making it clearer, 
Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the housing in uh, the 3D way. We have been working on several other uh, cases, and we have found out that the light has been working considerably for making things 3D. On the other hand, we talked about the remote working. So this information should be known at the site so that people at the working area will be understanding how they can work better. However, uh, several process needs a lot of time for computation. And the reason for this lateness is that we need to go through a process of multiple uh, pages and usual TVs are having different images like 30 uh, photographs within a minute or seconds. And I think uh, we have to be working through such a large number of photographs. And according to this number of images, the computation time differs. And we wanted to make much more efficient way to create a 3D and utilizing the uh, video took by the robot when the robot is working at low speed or else it's stalled and take pictures uh, you cannot see the differences with the photographs that the robots has been taking it is too similar to be able to be uh, utilized for recreating the 3d image from 2d Therefore, within the uh, motion video, we have to be uh, excluding uh, such similarity. And so what we hear, see here is that if the uh, photographs and the images are too similar, we're not going to be utilizing this. We're going to be excluding this. So uh, through this motion video, we are going to be utilizing a slightly different photographs in order to create 3Ds. So uh, the images that are not going to be contributing to creation of 3D, we're going to be excluding it, dropping it off. And by doing so, we're going to be much more effective and efficient in time. And as Fukushima sector introduced at NAREC, at the testing building, we have been running the robot and try the stop and go with the robot taking pictures and images. Uh, this is three speed times faster than the usual speed. So usually at actuality, it moves more slower. And the pattern that we saw that was the motion video becoming too similar in order to take it into 3D. But then from the video token, we're going to be uh, taking the videos, photographs that we can utilize. And then we understood that throughout the selection, we created a structure from the motion video utilizing the SFM process. And then we stuck the uh, video uh, images on top of the surface. This is the actual model that came out. And as you can see, it is rolling. We created two models, and one is applying the algorithm that I mentioned. And according to how you view, well, you might have different opinions. It might look different. It might look the same. But then on top, this is created by 15 photographs by second. And then utilizing 2,625 images, the uh, latter one was utilizing stop and a take is so taken by and slower speed and the image use was 207 impression could be different but then for us we thought that we created a very good model that is synchronizing together it's very important that uh, the uh, images are going to be created in, in shorter time. And it still takes five seconds in order to make this. But then the proposed method is faster than what we use, what we used to have. Therefore, we're trying to continue on to make this process even shorter. So how is this model going to be utilized in reality? So we have been asking NARIC member to help us out within the VR system. Right now we have the 3D model recreated and then it is now projected. And the operators are trying to confirm the site and try to understand what equipment they can use and what way they can work. And I think that could be useful at people's on-site work. And this is some the development that I have been working. And this is the robot simulator created at NAREC 2. And I have been taking part for the development. And if the uh, data 
view is now projected through this VR, uh, the operator will be able to experience what he is going to go through. And utilizing such system, I would like to go on collaborating and taking uh, the photographs and taking the images and create it into 3D in order so that people will be able to work even easier and at peace of mind. And going on to the next topic. Uh, this is the technology to uh, measure the distribution of uh, radiology. And so distribution of radiation is unknown by the accident. Uh, the, uh, we need to understand uh, how the radiation is distributed uh, by new in Sao. We're going to be decreasing the uh, dosage of the workers. And we can also consider how to do away with the hot, stop, hot spot. It's also going to be contributing to the safety, security of the workers too. And for the, uh, we can also avoid decontamination of the robots too. And uh, the distribution of the radiation, usually we have a survey meter traditional, so we can measure by spots with the plottings to make assumptions. But we would want to create that measurement by surface and it is very important that these measures could be done at an instance because it could be in a state where the radiation level is very fa uh, high. And it also is better if the equipment is small and light. So ga gamma ray imager sensor, uh, the Compton camera, uh, we have been working this on this Compton camera to make it lighter to be able to uh, hold it around. And so there's a, a this. This is the radiation and the gamma ray is going to be coming in and then it's going to be creating the Compton this uh, scattering. And then the scattered ray is going to be going on to the absorber. So the relation with the scatterer and the absorber and on the extension and then the incoming angle. All these are going to be the formula for the effect of the Compton. And then the theta is going to be acquired and then you can have this cone the orange type area is meaning that all the event happened could be measured and then the dots that is going to intersect is going to be the biggest largest hot spot based on Compton and then when you just lay uh, the photographs then you will understand visually intuitively understand that the radiation level is high at the intersection area as mentioned this Compton camera in order to utilize at the site it has to be small and light so we as a group member are working on this to make it light and the actual equipment is now made to this smallest it is around 700 grams or less and then usb vast power or bus power this is a usb on the calculators and you can utilize the uh, incoming power to drive this equipment it's a portable battery that could also make propulsion on this equipment. And then we are going to be putting on shields at the site and we have been measuring trials. And you can see the uh, round movement. Uh, that is the Compton, the orange area that we just mentioned. And then when we calculate, it is going to be converging into one area. And that converged area is assumed as a very high uh, radio, radi radiology uh, radiation level and that was 3.5 millimeter sievert uh, meaning that at the testing trial that area was high radiation level so this is an imager developed by us understanding where the radiation level is high and for the unit 3 uh, turbine building we brought this with the imager and the 3D imager has been creating a data and then we are measuring uh, this data uh, to be able to measure the distance and when we overlap 
the Compton only gives two dimensional uh, data, but then with uh, the uh, distance measuring, we will have a 3D maps. We don't have a model going around today, but then uh, from the uh, free vision, we can understand where the radiation is high or else maybe we can understand the distance too, starting from the nearest area toward the one meter radius. We do or are able to see where the high radiation area is. And this is a robot called Puckbot. And we have been putting our uh, measurement on top of this robot. And we have been showing what the puck bot has been taking photos of. So the hot pot spot is a, a red area. And we have been taking photographs, 240 photographs. And then we have been layering on top of our investigation in order to find out where about where the hot spot or the uh, high level radiation is in a three dimensional way. And we were able to sort of uh, make this realized. From here on, uh, we believe and expect that these technologies will be used at the onsite. So for decommissioning, we and I am working for development for understanding the spatial information. Uh, one thing was about uh, understanding the structural information and spatial information and the distribution of the radiation within this space and how to understand this in a very fast and efficient way. That's my first point that I would like to work for, especially for retrieving the or reconstructing the imaging by Compton camera and others were what I have been bringing up as a issue. And right now I'm working with TEPCO in order to have a better safe and safety security decommissioning. I am trying to continue on with my work uh, by doing so, or in order to do so, we would like to work even more how to have a better accuracy or have a faster process. The Compton camera that I have introduced, it does, so there's a potentiality that the Compton camera may not be able to activate with a very high radiation level. Uh, therefore, we're also trying to develop on a technology where the measurement could be working in high radiation. And for those who are working for robots, if we are able to have that um, operators be able to understand where the radiation distribution is, that could be dropped into the uh, making planning of the decommissioning. Another thing I would like to make is our members, everybody other than myself is very young. And with the help of TEPCO, we are doing the researching because we need to research at the onsite in order to understand that our measurement is all right or not. So from here on too, we would like to continue on with our way of researching, going onsite to measure. And with that, we would like to be supported by every people that supports us daily. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, we are going to have today's Q&A session, part one. If we have questions, raise your hand. Do we have some questions? No questions? Thank you. All right, then we will have a short break. We will resume the reporting at 3.35. Then when you leave the auditorium, Please do not forget to return the receiver at the entrance.
Now let me start the briefing. The next presentation is from Mr. Ito Masayasu, responsible for analysis and research facilities at Okuma Analysis and Research Center. The topic is facility management and developing younger generation researchers. Thank you. I'm Ito from Okuma Analysis and Research Center. Today I'm going to talk about the facility management of research centers and radioactive material analysis as well as human resource development. The overview of Okuma Analysis and Research Center. At this center, we conduct analysis and research of the property of radioactive waste and fuel debris. Then we have radioactive material analysis facility here. So the location of the center is very close to this place, about 20 minutes drive. Then we have administrative building and training workshop facility. So this is a facility management building and building number one is for analysis for low and mid-level waste and number two building for analysis of fuel debris. Then our plans of the facility. The radioactive material analysis facility uh, is should be conducted in the difficult return zone. So we have administrative building and we plan to open the laboratories. Then design phase, construction phase and operation. We have three phases for each building. So today, uh, for the building number one, the construction is undergoing and we plan to open the number one building in June next year. The second building, currently the design is conducted and implementation plan is evaluate, evaluated at NRA and we also have discussions with the local community. The overview of the building number one. Here we will an analyze the debris from 1F as well as incineration ash and secondary waste from water treatment. Then after analysis, then we will use the result uh, for the safety information for further disposal. So debris, ashes, and waste water waste. So this will be analyzed here. The materials uh, will be the low level debris having the one sievert an hour or less, or the secondary waste from water treatment. We plan to accept 200 units a year. The construction of the building then the detailed uh, design started in March to 2015. Then the analysis of facilities or the layout of the buildings were designed at the time. Then, then we will hand the mid-level waste here. Therefore, the shield has been well designed for safety. September 2016, then implementation plan was submitted for approval as a specified atomic facility. We started the construction in March 2017. The current status, the building is almost completed. The building was energized in September 2020. Steel cells, glove boxes, or hoods, these major components are completed. 
This shows the schematics of the number one building. It's a three-story high building and major facilities are located on the second floor, such as steel cell or glove boxes. And on the third floor, we will have uh, analysis tools. So the actual analysis will be conducted on the third floor. Then how we handle the test materials. The object is received on the first floor. We have the plenum chamber for accepting uh, test materials. Then we put them in the steel cell, glove boxes, or hood room. You can see the pictures of uh, these rooms. So we will uh, pre-treat the material here. After that, then we bring the material to the third floor where the analysis equipment will be located. The mid-level waste will be handled in the steel cell which is capable of shielding against radiation. The one millisievert or above so these materials uh, will be put into the steel cell after accepting and we pretreat for further analysis. These pictures show the construction of the building. The top left, June 2017, the foundation was put. Then on the right top, the building is complete. Currently, we are conducting the inside work. HVAC works, all the panels are being installed. And as I mentioned earlier, September 2020, the building was energized. Then we will pay attention to safety and uh, we are expanding our inside work. Then our equipment inside. The glove boxes were put into the building in June 2020. Currently, then we are working on the spaces for pre-treatment. So the pretreatment uh, will be conducted inside these glove boxes. Steel cells. Steel cells are already in place. And uh, then manipulator, remote manipulators are being installed. The bad hood rooms, they are already in place. Then we will evaluate the performance. The overview of the building number two. At the planned building number two, then we will analyze the fuel debris from 1F, then we plan to conduct the every aspect of analysis of fuel debris here. Then the, the result will be used to evaluate the criticality safety and the dose or gas dynamics will be assessed. So this will be the target of our work at the building number two. The targets, materials, which will be fuel debris. We plan to accept 12 batches of debris a year. This is the perspective of the completed building. Then a basement, one basement and two stories high building. April 2018, we started a detailed design of the building. At the time, because the building will be used for the analysis of radioactive material, necessary safety measures are implemented in the design. In May 2020, we 
have submitted the application for the implementation plan as a specified nuclear facility. Currently, we are waiting for the evaluation. The safety measures at the building number two, shielding and confinement uh, will be important. The, we will handle the fuel debris at the building number two and facilities are located on the first floor. We use concrete cells, steel cells or glove boxes. So we put radioactive materials inside uh, these equipment. So we will take necessary precaution against the possible exposure. Then the shielding will be effective enough to make the work safe. Then we plant accept a sizable volume of fuel debris, therefore we use we plan to use concrete which is one hundred centimeters or thicker. In safety measures at building number two, this is about criticality safety. <coughs> then radioactive materials will be included in the debris. Therefore, we need to pay attention about criticality. Then at the number two building, then we use the test material pit to handle debris, and we put holes to limit the mass of the test material. Therefore, the test material pits uh, will have a limited uh, volume and also the shape or the distance between the holes will be controlled to avoid criticality. So we will put these necessary precautions and we will of course uh, consider the safety against fire or earthquakes. Then R&D for effective analysis. At the building number one, we will have uh, many kinds of test materials. Therefore, the pre-treatment will be necessary for each test equipment. Some pre-work will need some complicated work. So therefore, the working time will be longer. Therefore, we need to pay attention to avoid unnecessary long hour exposure of our personnel. So based on these issues, then at Okuma Research and Development uh, Analysis and Research Center, we will take necessary precautions. Then one solution will be the automated pre treatment. One more development is the effective analysis method. And then we plan to use new equipment to eliminate the separation processes which have been necessary up to date. Also human resources development the younger generation researchers to conduct future analysis and research. At Okuma Analysis and Research Center, we plan to put building number one and number two into operation. Then our plan is to develop necessary human resources who will not only be the researchers, but also the radiologists and the technicians to conduct necessary analysis. In order to develop these human resources, then we will use the facility management workshop at the center, and we plan to use the facilities in Ibaraki area. On top of this, then this radioactive material analysis facility will be part of designated or specified atomic facility. TEPCO holdings uh, will be responsible for the safety. Then we will ask the TEPCO 1 facility to give training to the future researchers and technicians at this center. Summary. At Okuma Analysis and Research Center, 
We plan to facilitate the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Our service will include the analysis of radioactive materials and fuel debris. We are building our facilities. Then in 2021, we will start the operation at the building number two, and we will start the construction of building number two in the same year. Uh, this is how we will make our facilities ready. In JAEA Ibaraki area, there are several institutes such as Cycle Laboratory or ORI Laboratory, and with the help of TEPCA Holdings, then we will develop the necessary human resources to conduct analysis at building number one and two. Through these operations, then we will develop the younger generation researchers for future analysis and research, and this will ultimately contribute to the safe decommissioning of 1F and reconstruction of Fukushima. Thank you very much. Now next, from Naraha, we are going to be talk calling on Mr. Ito Rintaro. He is going to be talking under the title, Initiatives Taken by Naraha. Uh, Mr. Ito is from Promotion Section for Mock-up Trials at Naraha Center. Hello, everybody. As introduced, my name is Itobo. I work at Naraha Center for Remote Control Technology, and I would like to introduce our initiatives. So today, what I would like to report is going to be in line with what I have uh, right now here. I am following in this order. First of all, to explain about Naraha Center for Remote Control Technology Development, we are at the highest level of the southern part of the Natick. And the feature is that uh, this building could be seen from the National Road, so I think you have seen this building before. And Naraha Center has been called as a mock-up center, but starting this year, February, Now we are calling ourselves Narek, it taking the top part of each of the names that we have, Naraha and Remote and Control, Narek. So please call us as Narek. So after the accident of 1F, uh, the decision was made for the construction of the trial facility for remote control technology in 2013. Uh, we have acquired the land, and in 2015, the construction completed for the building. The then Prime Minister, Minister Abe, has been attending, which was a fanfare. And then in 2016, testing building completed. Starting 2016, uh, uh, April, now it has been in full swing for usage, and we are now entering our fourth year. The role of NAREC is to become the hub of the remote control technology development and to contribute to the reconstruction of Fukushima and decommissioning. And so specifically, this is about the demonstration trial and the research development for uh, the uh, remote operating equipment. We are now to provide the area so that the other people can work on such trials. And so. Uh, through uh, providing infrastructure and the testing bed, we too will be making development to sophisticate the technology. The Naraha Center largely put, we have the uh, research center and the trial center. For the research management uh, building, we have virtual reality system, and uh, there are uh, meeting rooms for the testing building. This is 80 meter versus 60 meter, and height is 40 meter, a very big uh, building. And we have them, a deep pool. Those are element trials that could be done. So this is a real size oh, 
real size uh, testing area where we can bring in the real size equipment to test. And we have some research centers too. And workshops could also be held within this area. It's difficult to see in this picture, but there are uh, various uh, multiple objective trial area outside too, and we have storage outside too uh, for a temporary warehouse. I would like to introduce how we were used in the past. Uh, with the iRAID, iRAID has been working with us within our building and with the container vessel uh, that was the real size full scale testing for repair and also about the full scale trial for creating the water circulating system within the container vessel. This was a very big a trial body which was in the 1A size of the sector. Uh, there we have been creating this mock-up and then training was uh, conducted. And last year, uh, this one has been moved out uh, from the inside to the outside. Uh, we have been uh, dismantling, disassemble this already. This is fully dismantled today. And last year, uh, there was a development for the research uh, technology for X6 penetration. Uh, this is a penetration, meaning it's a hole. And utilizing this hole, this was to make an investigation inside the uh, vessel. So starting from the in entrance of six uh, excess, X6, six, sorry, we have been creating the incoming route in order to find out what is inside. And we have been actually putting in robots through this X6, and we're now in schedule for a next mock-up trial. Other than that, private companies are utilizing our facilities too. This is a company, Atox and Able, utilizing us for a company, Atox. Uh, the they were wanting to be making an investigation for uh, the uh, training for the underwater robot. And also, uh, they wanted to do the testing for dust uh, scattering around. Mr. Ono has been talking about the Zeo light at TEPCO, but this ATOX was done before, prior to the ZTOX issue. And for ABEL, ABEL was trying to make a mock-up trial for collecting oil and pumping up uh, stagnant water in the underwater, under uh, level, underground level, at 1F. And other than that, there were some uh, schemes utilizing us for the Fukushima Innovation Code scheme, co scheme. This code scheme is is an area where the industry is now concentrated around the Hamadori area, the coastal area, in order to make reconstructions within the area. Within the scheme, uh, this uh, innovation coast area is situated, located as a hub to be re reconstructed. The IAI has been working with us uh, to create a large size drone and to make a demonstrational testing. Other than that, Takawa Precision Company uh, has been joining up with the Fukushima Kosen uh, to uh, chest, uh, check the Rad Hotaru the second, which is the underwater uh, rover robot. And the other case was that uh, every year, Fukushima is opening up an event called Robot Research Committee. and. This is an exhibition event, and we were situated as the opening venue of the exhibition. Uh, therefore, the decommissioning industry has been coming over to our infrastructure to make a matching event with the uh, private companies. Uh, this year, uh, we have been having this event last month, and 300 people or more have been visiting us. Other than that, uh, people who want to uh, nurture next generation uh, researchers are always utilizing us. For instance, the fourth decommissioning creation, Robocon. This Robocon exhibition, or sorry, the uh, Robocon Cup was held with us. Uh, we were supposed to have this uh, Robocon Cup 
This Saturday, however, hit by COVID-19, uh, this event is going to be held online. But last year, the uh, mock-up uh, pedestal was created by the cardboard cardboard box, and uh, the uh, students are were uh, working well for uh, the activity. For other cases, uh, universities use us too. For instance, the uh, Tokyo Polytechnic has been utilizing us with the LIDAR and SLAM three-dimensional testing. Tokyo University has been with us working for the inertia sensor to have an accurate information collected for the position information, to have a marker on top of a moving substances to understand speed and angle of velocity. Fukushima University has been utilizing us for the uh, characteristic testing for propulsion of screws cluster. And Wakasa Energy Research Center has also been working with us. Every year they are having the decommissioning seminar and they have been working on motion capture, a robot razor decommissioning uh, practice for the robotics. Other than that, at NARIC, NARIC too has a own scheme for education. Last year we have been establishing the uh, practice program for maneuvering robotic operation. It could be the simulators for robotics or it could be robotics for others. Various people can utilize our simulation and through the simulation people are experiencing the kind of operating robot or else they can also go through a creation of robot therefore is very specific this program is not a fixed one therefore according to people's needs we are making the programs last year there were 12 users with this program for fukushima innovation coastal skiing we have been combining ourselves to work with the high schools within this area I have just been introducing how much people were utilizing our institution. Within four years, there were 230 cases used. For this fiscal year, there are, so we assume that uh, 50 cases are uh, with us this year. And for looking at the number of usage by objectives per year, you can find that there are a lot of people who are working and coming over to us because they would like to work for the decommissioning of 1F. So whether it be 1F decommissioning or people wanting to work for Innovation Coast uh, Framework, we too want to be uh, coordinating with their activity. Now let us introduce about the technological development for NAREC. At ourselves, we are always thinking about sophisticating our technological uh, capability. Therefore, we are developing on the testing methodology to evaluate quantitatively about the performance of robots. And with that same objection, we are developing simulators and VR too. And so we have digital and the actual uh, equipment for the researching and combining these together we are having an idea to have both the real and the VR work together in one. The other day, the, there was a robot um, reporting issued, or sorry, the publication is going to be uh, open and disclosed. It is also going to be disclosed on our website. So if you do have any interest, please come over and visit our website. And lastly, Uh, this is about uh, the uh, search for emergency, and our system is used for uh, such search and rescue issue too. Uh, within this development, I would like to touch upon VR system even more. Uh, this system is utilizing four uh, full screen for four surfaces, cave type, and by uh, projecting the simulation for 1F utilizing VR technology, uh, the people will be able to experience the uh, feeling in the atmosphere of F1, sorry, 1F. Uh, this is a VR system actually opened at NAREC. And for 1F, we have unit one to three and we have first floor and the ground floor. 
and uh, projecting the latest news and we are trying to expand uh, uh, with the coordination with Tokyo Electric Power Company. Today in the second of floor at the equipment show we are introducing everybody who will visit us to be able to experience the second floor at 1F. Uh, please come over at our booth. And the VR simulator motion capture uh, working in coordination is something that IRID has been working us. So specifically, they have been working for the uh, testing for manipulation of the actual size testing, testing for repair and water storage for the leakage for uh, the underneath of the container vessel. And we too have been taking in part for this test. We have been making testing, creating and mock up just the real size of a real uh, container vessel. Uh, so this is a training and there is no fear it to destroy the real container vessel because it is VR. And within the verification, the motion capture can measure the real testing and then it could be projected to the uh, real data. Therefore, we, our development is now coming very near to real because this VR measurement is now linked with the real. So far, I've been mentioning about what we do for development of technology, and further on from here on, upon our technology, we would like to uh, use our expertise of 1F and utilize these knowledges to be digitalized in order to have more streamlined, efficient way of work for 1F decommissioning. In the future, we would like to make it into a data uh, data hub in order to control decommissioning or control debris, etc. Therefore, making it into a platform of data, it could be utilized in various ways. So this is now going to be the summary. NIAC has been working fully since 2016 fiscal year, April, and have been working for the demonstration field for more than 200 cases. We have been used for a large size mock-up testing, and we are also going to be scheduled to be utilized for the mock-up testing for picking up the uh, fuel debris for the second unit. Other than that, uh, various uh, remote technology development is going to be be utilized for the one FD commissioning and for a human talent development. We are liaising with the technical college and working from the framework of the uh, decommissioning creation Robocon Cup. So utilizing the uh, VR expertise and expertise and knowledges from the 1FD commissioning, we would like to digitalize all the knowledges that we have in order to contribute to the decommissioning work. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now we are going to have the next Q&A session. If we have questions, please raise your hand. Then the microphone is on its way. Thank you very much for informative presentations. The human resource development and also remote technology, the robotics and others, yes, the younger generations are keenly working on decommissioning or the nuclear Engineering. I'm Kitazawa, working at the university. It's good that younger generation people think about the decommissioning or nuclear industry. And you need to have the hands-on experience in terms of analysis or then have training at the facilities, it, although it's not easy, as I understand. Then on slide 88, the human resource development, it is not complete, but in future, our plan is to send younger generation engineers or the college students 
to visit that there to have hands-on experience. I think that will eventually lead to the effective decommissioning project going forward. It will take 30 or 40 years. It is our obligation to produce necessary human resources. What is your ideas? Thank you for your question. At the Okuma Center, at Okuma, then we really want the college student to be interested in the decom decommissioning work. So the, our program will be provided during the summer holidays. Well, we have already conducted one experience at the glove boxes and operating analytic equipment. And on top of that, at Okuma Center or the sector of Fukushima R&D, the short-term internship, so only a day or two days internship that will be easier for university students. And we have already accepted students in these programs. By doing this, then younger generation people will feel that the commissioning work closer to them. Do we have some more questions? Do we have any questions? Now, we have completed scheduled presentations for the day. We are going to have a few words from Mr. Noda Koichi, Executive Director and Director General of Sector of Fukushima R&D, JAEA. Thank you for your participation at the 2020 briefing session from sector of Fukushima research and development. Thank you very much. Then we have had COVID-19 and we had second thoughts about delivering sessions like these. But this year, 2020, is the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. And On top of lectures or presentations, we wanted to have the poster sessions uh, from younger generation researchers or students uh, from colleges. And so that's why we delivered uh, this briefing session at this Manami Nobori facility. So thank you again very much for your participation and thank you for listening and seeing the presentations. Then the live performance presentation face to face is quite effective. It's different from having meetings online. The two-way communication has been well established. So the researchers or younger generation researchers, then it's really good for them to have the first-hand experience of having the sessions like this. So thank you very much for your support. For this year's briefing, then 10 years history of reconstruction and decommissioning, that was the theme. Then the earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear accident, and they were almost 10 years ago. Some things have been improved. We have made some strides. At the same time, there have been challenges, and there will be. Then, and please do visit poster sessions and booths. And we have already exchanged opinions. Thank you very much. So we will put 
better use of your opinions and feedbacks and we will move on with our research and development. Reconstruction of Fukushima and the decommissioning of 1F, they are still undergoing. We are committed to the hard and safe work going forward. Thank you very much for your collaboration and support. Thank you for your participation again. With this FY 2020, the RND uh, sector of Fukushima uh, research uh, reporting briefing is now concluded. Thank you very much for your participation for such a long time. Uh, the simultaneous uh, devices for translating and uh, the questionnaire that you have filled up, uh, please uh, send it over to the reception when you are leaving this venue. Uh, the shuttle bus for Tomioka Station is going to be earlied up uh, 4.30 and 4.35 at the right front of the entrance and exit of this building. The shuttle bus is going to be departing at 4.30 or 4.35. The Tomioka Station to Iwaki, uh, 5.06 and Haranomachi, 5.27 are the trains. Uh, please do not leave your belongings and please be secured when going back home. Thank you very much indeed for your great participation.